Hello and welcome to the first session of Pattern Recollection, Modalities of Contemporary Thought Processes. This seminar will focus on contemporary philosophy and theory as an exercise in thinking about the future in the past 10. Moderated by Davo Loeffler and Patrick Schabus, this seminar will feature seven philosophers, thinkers and theorists who have made a major contribution to their field in the last five years. They will be focusing on the epistemological dimension of their practice, showing how their work addresses the social, political and cultural realities of contemporary life on a computationally interconnected planet Earth. Today is June 9th. This is the introduction session. In which we will uh, uh, go into two texts, one by Davo Loeffler and one by Rezal Nigar Istani. Davo Loeffler earned his PhD in sociology from FIU University in Berlin with an interdisciplinary thesis on the shift of social structures, cognition, and temporality in the technological civilization. He worked as lecturer in sociology and philosophy at the BTK University of Art and Design in Berlin and collaborated in various interdisciplinary working groups such as the Mind Machine Project at the MIT Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA, the Interacting Mind Center, Aarhus, Denmark, and the role of culture in early expansions of humans group at the Institute of Prehistory, Tübingen. Germany. He's author and editor in the field of cultural theory and philosophical anthropology and co-founder of the journal Plateau, Zeitschrift für experimentelle Kulturanthropologie. Patrick Chabos is an independent Berlin-based uh, artist, filmmaker and curator who holds an MA in visual arts from the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna. This is me and since so let's start this session. Uh, Davo, do you want to uh, start with uh, your uh, presentation or should I start with my presentation? Uh, please start with your presentation. Okay. Hmm. I have uh, I've been given this copy by, by, by Schum and it is the text Unidentified Vital Object, which you can all find uh, as a PDF. Okay. Uh, uh, at this date, the latest text of Reza Negristani, and I'm now going to present it in a very uh, abbreviated uh, way, and I will exp ex also ex ex describe why I this text. I, I think uh, this text is a very uh, good example how uh, philosophy can interact with art and how uh, it uh, it can help uh, uh, foster uh, some uh, ideal exchange between these sometimes not really inter interconnected uh, spheres. So I will now start my presentation. I, I know not how this Crassus with his lamprey enters my mind as the image of myself reflected across the abyss of centuries. Hugo von Hoffmann the whole difference. Reza Negaristani uh, clusters his text in different uh, Überschriften, uh, uh, top, top layers, I would like to call them, because this uh, also works uh, as a description of, 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 uh, of the modality that he has in his text. So they are always like these different layers he's, he's like sub in his like subtext in each its own and he goes uh, 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 deeper and deeper and uh, in, 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 in the, into the material uh, that he uses to uh, build uh, his, uh, his text and the text itself is about uh, the mind and uh, about the expansion of the mind and 
uh, about the possibilities of uh, uh, one sub layer of the mind that we call this the ego and how the ego actually uh, 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 discerns from itself and, and the other. Yes, is there somebody with, with, with the audio? Oh, okay, okay, okay. Just mute yourself. So, so and, and uh, he he builds this uh, is this notion of 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 different worlds of di different layers, so to speak. Which I read uh, as as a, as a as a classical Deleuzian notion as, as a, um, infinite plateaus, basically. Because there is not mill plateau, he he describes uh, it as 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 a potentially uh, infinite uh, world making machine, which which is uh, is is the world and also uh, the possibilities of of phenomenological uh, interaction with with it. So. Reza starts the text with uh, 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 541 million years ago, and he describes it. It is uh, it's the Cambrian expl uh, explosion of mind forms, and he he then uh, describes something that I. I uh, really think it's, it's crucial here he, he calls it the organ of alienation and this organ of alienation is uh the whole text is very poetic in, in, in a way so he never quite lets himself be pinpointed at something which i really find is amazing and so it is potentially uh the expansion of of of, of the may uh, of the brain to from from it's previous uh, he calls it primitive notions to to an up uh, a kind of upgraded uh, for, form and this is the organ of alienation so it's it's developed uh, to uh, to yeah to foster survival and reproduction and this uh, formation out of the rudimentary ego that is not stable not not per permanent is 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 for me a, a, a symbolic way to describe uh, what our mind still is it's 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 constantly uh, clustering meaning it, it is building on, on clusters and then it forgets other clusters so that's why we can't uh we we, we are different me's when we are interacting with other uh, other people and Reza describes this by saying that we are we have this uh, this uh the, this predator notion so it is uh that the, the predator uh, identifies itself with the other. And I actually think that you can uh, open this up, that you don't actually have to need to say it's only the predator. I think the, 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 this is a core uh, modality of the adaptability of, of, of humans that they uh, always like uh, latch on or to what other people do, like the, the mirror neurons. And so he says, the predator, predator identifies itself with the prey. It becomes the prey itself as to successfully complete the hunt with maximum efficiency. And I think- hey Patrick, can you restart that sentence? You cut out. Okay, so you mean the last sentence? The prey, it becomes the prey itself as to successfully complete the hunt with maximum efficiency. So we can see that uh, the hunt is, uh, is, is, is survival. You have to, to eat something. Uh, this is like a first level understanding of, of, of the hunt. But the hunt is uh, 
expanded in our contemporary or even medieval uh, it's like after we developed civilization the hunt has become other things i mean i'm not uh fully uh, equipped as as davor is to talk about the history of, of, of the hunt but, but but from my perspective is that even uh, trying to find a job is is a hunt so you try to identify yourself with your potential employer you, you become your employer in a way and then you write uh uh prospective uh, application job application trying to become more like them by writing like them and then and, and sending them uh, uh, uh the, the paper looking in their design style and stuff something like that so there's like this this kind of uh self camouflage it now this is not naturally it's, it's like not no longer built in it in us it is it's synthesized we we have to to activate it we have to like uh try to do it uh consciously but here he still describes it as something that happens to us like a, a first layer of uh of uh adaptability so then he uh he, go, he goes into the the the, um, the forms of how destabilization uh can actually uh happen in 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 the mind in in any mind because he never uh specifically describes it as as the human so it can also stand for ai and other other forms so he says that the prey is a prosthesis for the hunter meaning that the the hunter naturally uh reconstructs its prey in his brain and it's a that's a uh we can call it it's uh informed by determinism meaning that uh all of the outside is actually only mediated by you there is we are basically always living in in a medium of our own uh re representation of what the minimal information we have of the outside so yes so let's uh, yes so it's, uh, and and, and la later on he goes to describe something that I, I i really found amazing and he calls it the retractable ego he has the lamp lampe which is an animal who can retract is its its uh form uh, of which that it uses for hunting and uh but this is just a symbol well what, what is uh what is so great about the idea of the uh uh retractable uh retractable ego is that that you can uh basically use your your ego like like a weapon or a tool uh as as, as much some uh, some people would maybe think that this is a flawed notion i still think it's a it's a it's amazing uh symbol and so he writes it is only when this alien ego is contacted when its mission is complete that the shock of the alien Comes palpable. Faced with the true nature of the situation, the unsuspected prey recoils in horror, and the predatory self regains its full composure, not even remembering that it was not there moments ago. So he has this notion of the the alien ego of 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 let's say the, the an ego that is outside of of our own ego like just like two humans or a human or a dog or whatever it's like really the other other is not just like uh uh uh, uh schizoid uh representation of something that only happens in the mind like uh 
uh, and like somebody who's me, me, meeting uh, his dead grandmother in when uh, he woke up or something. So it's, it's really uh, another person, but that other person is is different uh, in that the mind has not yet seen such a person. The, the other person has not uh, been uh, uh, inscribed as an, uh, now I'm going into Jung, uh, like in, as an archetype, as somebody, uh, as something that is actually already in, in, in a cupboard. It's, it's, it's new and, and that's why the ego, uh, uh, it, it, that, that, why that is linked to the tractable ego. And in uh, the next chapter, which is called uh, That Which Draws in Stone, all, all of that uh, relates to the lampe as a symbol. He makes uh, the distinction between the self and the alien and, and how it is, gets blurred. And he then describes uh, in how the evolution of the nervous system happened. And specifically, uh, he describes uh, the catastrophe of dimensions. And he calls it uh, the brave new nervous system, which is a naturally a, a play on uh, this dystopian literature and, and such, which is uh, the literature that, that, that became, uh, stood before uh, uh, literature, uh, uh, like, like uh, uh, cyber literature and stuff like that. So he goes into the description of the primitive uh, predator and here I'll, I'll quote him again. The primitive predator requires a sense of constant wakefulness, which has now been replaced by language. The neurophysical can go partial, partially to rest. The predatory vigilance of the old ego is not only transformed, but also taken over by language, particularly in its semantic and conceptual dimensions. It is not hard to guess what happens when symbolic forms in the syncretic, semantic, and pragmatic richness begin to interface with the old sentiment permanent ego. The old ego is terraformed and mutated. Certain aspects of the old ego, particularly the self-alien duality are preserved, but also undergo metamorphosis through both accumulation and transformations brought about by linguistically enabled enculturations. And here he goes, I'll wait for the video. Uh, uh, here he goes into uh, the phrase of. Okay, thanks a lot. So uh, uh, here he goes he, into how myths are, are created, and he then uses the example of uh, the Babylonians, uh, the Assyrians, and the Sumerians, and he he, he uses these civilizations to uh, bring forth the notion of the alien. The alien as back then uh, the angel, uh, gods and guardians. And he then uh, says that this uh, kind of demonic population or angelic population is a representation of uh, our own vices and virtues. Classically, I uh, mean, all virtues and vir uh, and vices are always uh, come from a so societal norms. So we have to take the, the word uh, vices and, and, uh, and sins and all of that with a grain of salt. But still, these are. It's it's again it's a symbol for for, for that. The alien other is a representation of, of, of ourselves. We, we 
project ourselves on, on onto the world and therefore we don't have the ability to actually see the world we see it uh, mediated by our own uh, normative filters so to speak uh, and then he has a, a, a quote in, in the next chapter that he uh, and I really want to uh, read you that quote. It is by Julian Badur from the discovery of dynamics and the quote goes like this. Profoundly aware of the fact that we and the earth cut loose from the mo moorings were adrift on the sea, he, Copernicus, looked about him for handy pieces of driftwood to make a raft. Being a very skilled craftsman, he chose and measured his wood with great care and added nothing to the raft before he knew that it fitted exactly. In this way, he slowly extended the raft and almost paradoxically finished up with foundations of a sort of which the scout never dreamed, secure because taken straight from nature and productive because he also laid down workable ground rules for extending the raft. First measure carefully before anything, otherwise it is liable to fall off again. So uh, here he uh, uh, gives us uh, again uh, 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 a wink to to uh, 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 sort of, sort of uh, let, let, let's say. Uh, 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 non-skeptical skepticism when he uh, 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 cynically uh, or ironically uh, quotes Eric Vodeniken, but he uh, uses him as a, as a counter uh, uh, quote where he says that uh, the, the cultural preoccupations with angels and demons uh, is, uh, can be seen as uh, aliens in spacesuits which clearly uh, Reza says is uh, bogus, but it, it, it's it's nice to see something like that included in the text because uh, very well, uh, so random. You you go outside of uh, the, the field of, of epistemology uh, and still be able to stay in inside of it. So in uh, in the chapter, I, I skip a chapter here. In the chapter uh, which makes a new stone, and I'm skipping the other chapter to read a little bit on that. Uh, so I'm going to read, uh, going to read you this uh, half of the chapter. It is called "That Which Makes a New Stone," and uh, he starts with a quote by Robert Lindner from the 50-minute hour, and this is the quote. How can I explain this to you? One moment I was just a scientist, an X reservation, bending over a drawing board in a clapboard OQ in the middle of an American desert. The next moment I was Kirk Allen, lord of a planet, in an interplanetary empire in a distant universe, garbed in the robes of his exalted office, rising from the carved decks he has been sitting at walking towards a secret room in his place. Palace, going over a filing cabinet in a recess in the wall, extracting an envelope of photographs and studying the pictures with intense concentration. It was over in a matter of minutes, and I was again at a drawing board. But I knew the experience was real, and to prove it, I now had a vivid recollection of the photograph and no trouble at all completing the map. He starts his text. Since the time Wilhelm Reich penned contact with space, Oranur, second report to the time where Jacques Vallée wrote revelations, alien contract and human deception, there was, there has been a fascination with an unidentified gliding object, UGO. This fascination is not equal exactly about another alien ego from a different world visiting us, i.e. the scenario 
of the arrival of aliens or the so-called UFO, but rather how we see ourselves as aliens, different selves or alien vehicles of thinking and perception gliding over the orbit of our old world egos. A scenario of UGO where secret military operations, science fiction, schizophrenia, and the departure of the ego from its old shell towards its new adventures as an alien is portrayed with unsettling ramifications and convergences, twists and turns its jet propelled couch. A case of psychoanalysis reported by psychiatrist Robert M. Lindner in his collection, The 50 Minute Hour, Jet Propelled Couch, recounts the story of a pseudonymous patient called Kirk L. As a brilliant physicist working for a top secret military project, Alan, a punctual and hard working employee, has lately been missing his deadlines quite frequently. He's profoundly apologetic about these incidents and promises to get back on track, but he never does. Finally, upon his about the assistance of his boss, he confesses that he has been living elsewhere and will really try hard to spend more time on this planet. So here it is the, the, the text gives you two possibilities to either read it uh, as uh, uh, as an analysis of uh, of different world makings but also different world makings as, as, as Shih Tzu poesis, uh, and also uh, this predator uh, prey uh, notion and uh, of the outsideness that he early on described. Uh, definitely there are other ways to read, read this, but this is, these are the one, uh, the, 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 these are the two that are most importantly for me. Uh, so he, he, he goes on, an avid reader of science fiction, Alan has encountered something deeply strange. He has noticed that in some of his most favorite science fiction novels, the protagonist is actually him. The lives of these protagonists are fragments of his own life biographical details, which he has forgotten, but now remembered upon reading them. Like any good detective, of the self, Alan begins a systematic task to put together these recollections, stories about the lives of aliens in different universes into the comprehensive biography of who he actually is. <coughs> is the audio lagging bad for the rest of you? Uh, if, if yes, then please write it in the group chat and we uh, try to amend it somehow. In the process of putting to Together, the fragments of his lost uh, memories, Alan creates a multiverse of alien worlds in which he has been living all along. These are multiverse where worlds have different measure systems. <coughs> Sorry. Where there are new colors, tastes, smells, and cognitions which are not of this term. So, I hear, I hear like to stop with, with my reading. Uh, thanks a lot. Great luck for writing in the group chat and everything's fine. So uh, uh, these uh, these other worlds where that have things that we can't experience in in this world is a, is a story, but it, but it's still that uh, let's say let's say uh, one animal can experience senses that that we don't have. Then this is. Uh, phenomenological possibility for, for this animal, but it's a no ramon for 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 other. It is thing outside itself. So I just uh want to go to the next page. Uh, so the, he just then goes on and describes the, that you can see the self as a being living in an alien multiverse and that's uh, what what I actually uh, uh, I understand this as as a notion that uh, there, are, there there's a finite uh, possibility to experience the world. That's 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 a fact that we, we know that it is not possible to experience 
an, an unlimited uh, worlds inside of this world. But there are still some things that we as humans can't experience. We can't really experience infrared with, with, with our eyes, without applications and stuff like that. And there are other possibilities that lie outside, but that, that lie outside in the world, lie not inside of us. So that's my understanding what he means with uh, the alien universe. So there is uh, not only the, 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 the idea that we live in one multiverse and then there are others, we can also use this to think about our own world, about this, this planet we are on, about uh, the specificity of our own species. And so, thanks, uh, uh, Akin. He, he wrote uh, what Quentin wrote, uh, calls exoscience fiction. So, so he goes in to uh, say that uh, I'm really nearly finished with, with this. So, hold on. Uh, he call he, and I, I actually think it's better if I actually read this to you. Uh, he goes on to say that Goodman sh shows that we have an alternative scenario. All observed emeralds are green with 40. So he goes in to uh, build uh, uh, again on, 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 on linguism. And uh, he, sa he says that uh, we have, we can say that uh, uh, the crow, crows, uh, crows, in the, the black animal that, that harkens around and then eats dead animals. Uh, the, uh, so uh, we can say that they are black. But since we also have uh, white crows, we can so, some say this is a white crow. But you can also mix this world, these words like this. So uh, he uses an emerald because an emerald is, is a green diamond. It's not a, it's a green uh, stone. It's translucent and, and you know it. But there are others that at some point you say it's no longer an emerald. So it needs to be green to be an emerald. But if we actually mix blue and green, we, become, we get grew, grew, like a mixture. Uh, naturally, this is a uh, utopist. It's, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantasy. It's, 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 a, it's all again like a, a, a symbol of, of, of description. It's, it's not something that we will not be able to create an, a universe, a world, a society where suddenly we will change uh, our words and make this, this a mixture of words uh, like grew or uh, grave or something like that, so like a mixture of gray and, 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 and another word. So, but we have, he uses this then to go into the notion of the habituation and so here he i'll just read to you rule is seen as an unnatural predicate or projectable however it is only unnatural because we are perceptually and no ethically i.e from the perspective of our sensory processing linguistically systems and modes of hyper hypothesization habituated to green rather than rule but both green and grew are permissible. We are both dehabituate ourselves with regard to the use of the predicate green and instead could project the predicate grew onto the world. We could see all emeralds as grew. The construction of the new alien world, therefore, comes hand in hand with our capacities for dehabituating ourselves with respect to the use of the so called natural and or entrenched predicates to display the characteristics of a rooted perceptual noetic pose. This dehabituation process is already underway in the field of cognitive sciences, particularly artificial intelligence, where perceptual noetic elements can be modified and reconfigured, for example, by reconstructing the constructive memory of 
or introducing new artificial languages with higher logical computational capacities. From the elements of the old sensory conceptual world, alien worlds of perception and cognition, new ways of knowing can be made. There are worlds, worlds in which crows can be blight, black, white. The earth sky can be blean, blue, green. An apple tastes frenzied, and the stone feels sore. The a apen, the new, uh, so he creates uh, a new word out of the ape, and he calls the apne. I'll just write. So it's the apne, A P N E. The apne, the new hybrid artificial child of the close encounter of the seventh kind, can endlessly play with these toys, predicates by projecting them onto reality in different ways. As which a 1980s legal kit for the Death Star, the Apney is not interested in following the given model and building a Death Star. It is more interested in making a dragon out of the available perceptual noetic toy blocks, a farm, a spaceship, a throne suitable for the god that it now is. That which makes a new world in which all green stones as rule sees its old world from the perspective of an alien world. The apne constantly goes back and forth between the old world and the new world, abducting elements from the former in order not only to create other worlds, but also to reveal how fragile the Earth home was all along, exposing it as a false report, report of a UFO. So this concludes the text. And thanks a great lot for, for listening. And maybe we want to go into discussion later and I'll give uh, the mic to Davour now. Okay. So, uh, okay, thank you, Patrick. Patrick. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, just a question, so I came a little bit too late. Did you already introduce everybody? Uh, did everybody introduce everybody to each other? Is it not? I think, uh, uh, honestly, I, I think uh, it's, it's better for the video if we just uh, do the uh, presentation first and then we do the uh, uh, presentation of, of the students after our presentation. Oh, okay. Good. I Good. think it looks better in the archive. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, no, okay. Well, I thought it would be good for discussions to know who is uh, from what coming from what direction and who not. No, I, I don't this. think that. Uh, uh, Mm. Just, uh, just as a okay. okay, I mean we can do it right now, but I think it's it's better for us both as mm. as, as instructors if uh, if the people uh, mm -hmm. uh, explain who they are directly mm. before the discussion, because then also people in the archive have that more in mind. Mm -hmm. I'm completely okay with whatever you want. No, okay. Uh, so wait a second. Am I deciding now or the students? <laughs> Okay, I'll decide now and, and I will say that uh, we'll just continue. Okay? Yes. Okay. So, um, who is still there? I see. I think we have a full class. We have one, two, three, four, yeah. five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, we have ten. Uh, 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 together with us, we're twelve. No, oh, okay. Uh, all right, so I'm just looking uh, if I'm talking to somebody or everybody left or something like this. Okay, so I'm talking to somebody. Uh, yeah, welcome to the seminar. Uh, a bit before I start uh, to introduce quickly what I uh, to, to my work, I just wanted to say that yeah, yeah. Thanks, Patrick, for the for the for the ride through this very difficult, let's say, or problematic or debatable text of, of Fraser and Egaristani. So there are uh, should uh, certainly many ways on how you can read it and you know how you can navigate to use his term <laughs> through this world that he is building there so to speak um, and, and i guess we we'll get to that uh, later again so uh, as i understood the seminar is basically some sort of stroll uh, uh, through different topics which are kind of uh, i would say at, at the frontier of thought 
currently. And not only uh, um, because we are very progressed and very, uh, so to speak, the, the newest of, of the new, so to speak, theory and philosophy developments, but we also uh, somehow always related to uh, the, the question of uh, the, the, the how, how do how do we contextualize the present? Not anymore uh, in regard to the past, but to the future. Uh, so, in other words, we are already uh, so um, we are looking at the present from a future and not in this difference to the past anymore, so to speak. Uh, and and uh, it seems like as if um, most of the chosen uh, teachers and lecturers and, and topics that will be talked about in this seminar uh, are, so to speak, exploring or probing this strange new space, uh, looking at ourselves from potential futures, so to speak. Yeah. And um, and I think in this uh, uh, in in this uh, context, uh, also the text of uh, Reza must be read. Uh, probably we can talk about it later. There's one part that uh, the, the one chapter that um, Patrick skipped, where he talks exactly about this, about this uh, looking at ourselves from the potential future, um, which comes automatically when we look at ourselves from an evolutionary perspective. Um, anyway, so. So what I'm saying is uh, this uh, session today is, so, so to speak, the intro into this whole, you know, to sensitize uh, uh, the, the, the students, so to speak, for this question, as it was announced in the uh, in the description of the seminar. I mean, of course, it means more than only this, uh, but but uh, but this is, so to speak, a, a way to probe, yeah, to, to probe and to, uh, how do you say this, um, yeah, explore basically this, this the, the potential of this strange new relation, so to speak, to time. Um, yeah, so far. Um, okay, so now uh, I'm not sure what I should, uh, should I talk about my work now a little bit or do we already discuss the text? Has anybody read the text? No, I the think text? If, if, if you would talk about your work. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Hutch says yes, uh, means I have, okay. So many people say I have, I believe you have all read the text. Okay, so because if you have read the text, I'm not sure if I should really repeat myself again. Um, uh, I could quickly. Uh, I could also use a PowerPoint presentation if you like. I have a beautiful PowerPoint <laughs> presentation. Um, let, let me see, maybe. Okay, you would like to hear my rendition of the text. Um, okay, look. Uh, so we have two options now. Uh, I'm sorry, I mean, it's, it's not that I'm not prepared. I just, you know, I just left it open. It's like in Reza's text, it's world making, you know, so we can go in this direction or we can go in this direction. So I can give you a PowerPoint presentation or we can discuss, or I can give you, I can just summarize the text again. Okay, PowerPoint, please. Um, all right, then I'll do just quickly a PowerPoint. I, um, I hope I'll be very fast, uh, usually. So sometimes it happens that these PowerPoint presentations take a long time. So we'll just give you a brief general intro, okay? Like a very general, what, what the background of this type of thinking is. And then I'll get closer to the text. Make sense? Yeah. Okay, so, um, yeah, um, how should I say? Okay, let me just say something about myself. That's why I ask if we should, uh, present, uh, if we should um, introduce ourselves. So uh, I, I'm a sociologist, but uh, not only, I'm also a philosopher and an anthropologist, like philosophical anthropologist. And my question was, um, and I think this is the question, the only question that the whole humanity right now has is, uh, um, can we get out of modernity? So this was my question. So ca how can we get out of modernity? Can we, can we change? Can, can we get a system uh, change? Can we get a system transition? Uh, why? Because we are obviously destroying the planet. So if, if it's true, then in 2035, uh, we will reach the 1.5 uh, degrees warming, and then it will become irreversible. And you know, who knows with what consequences uh, this, will, this will have. And the uh, main reason for this is capitalism. I mean, it's, it's very clear. So nobody controls the market. It's unregulated and uh, yeah, we are <laughs> obviously, obviously the market doesn't have the capacities to implement uh, of values and factors uh, which are not profit oriented, so to speak. So in other words, the, it, it's, uh, uh, if you want to save the planet, then it means it's something that cannot be coded in profit or non-profit. And that means we don't see it. The market doesn't see it. It's not coded in, in a way how the market, re, uh, uh, um, so to speak, uh, it's not rendered in a way that the market can see it. 
Okay, so in other words, uh, hoping for the market uh, or for capitalism to save us uh, doesn't make sense. It doesn't work. So the question was, how do how do we get out of this? Um, anyway, so um, okay. So and now we can speculate a lot. So you have accelerationism, you have different uh, post-capitalist, uh, um, you know, proposals. Uh, and but this is all speculation. So I wanted to know: uh, can we, can we really, can we somehow from history derive if there is a, a way how to get out of, of capitalism? Um, of course, this has been done a lot of times. Like Marx uh, says, he found a way how to derive, you know, how to get out of capitalism and, and so on. Uh, but obviously, this was not convincing, or it didn't work. Let's say uh, for several several reasons. The fact is also that, um, for example, Marx his theory simply doesn't work because he didn't have the knowledge at the time in 1850 to produce a historical theory that will explain him what capitalism is. Right? I mean, it doesn't mean that we have. Better, if we have better knowledge, of course, not uh, total knowledge, but better knowledge today, so we can uh, look at these things from a different perspective. And as uh, when you've read my text, uh, you've seen that there is another way to look at what capitalism is, right? Anyway, so uh, my question was this uh, obviously, we have um, with technology, so with the new technology, with computer technology, information technology, obviously, we have a new type of um, you know, technology happening. And now, if you look at history, at uh, shifts. Uh, in technology, um, can we see, how should I say, um, let, let me say the other way around. So um, you, we look at history and we see that whenever a new technology comes, sooner or later we have new institutions, new types of cognition, new types of subjectivity, uh, you know, new social organizations and new media and so on. Um, so there is a correlation between technologies and sociality, uh, a correlation between technology and the mind. Okay, so there's a co-evolution. Um, so, and uh, uh, so my question was, um, capitalism was developed, let's say, in the last 500 years. And can it be, uh, could it be that based on the current technologies that are emerging right now, like in the 20th century, the 21st century, um, are they maybe the, the, the seed, the seeds of a new type of economy that will grow out, so to speak, of this new technology, all right? So you see, uh, changing, uh, so, so you see the idea is this, um, not uh, changing or, uh, or getting out of the capitalistic path dependency by revolution, by going against it, by, but, uh, but by taking its uh, uh, potentials, which are, so to speak, uh, which have been derived, uh, so how to say, which have been grown in, in, the, in the technologies. Okay. So the idea was, uh, is, there, is there a potential for a civilization that comes after modernity? based on the current technologies. Yeah, does that make sense? Okay, so we are, lo we are looking ahead. What's coming next? What's coming after modernity? So this is, uh, this is the idea. And um, uh, so can we derive this from history? Um, okay, so now I would quickly, so this was just the introduction. I hope this was somewhat clear. Um, again, uh, to repeat this one more time. So, so the problem is this. Uh, today, we still have institutions which are 250 years old. So uh, capitalism, the market, uh, modern democracy. Uh, I, I'll, ask, I'll, I'll talk about this later. So Ekin is asking if postmodernity is still modernity. Yes and no, OK. <laughs> uh, so both. Uh, but uh, let's, let's talk about this later. Uh, so, uh, so what I mean with modernity, I mean, um, uh, the, the whole, okay, let's say the whole time from 1400 till 1900, up to today, partially. So there's an overlap. Uh, anyway, so uh, what, what I'm saying is we, we have, uh, today we live in institutions which have been built and, and constituted and established 250 years ago, approximately, and um, under a totally different technological situation, under a totally different media situation. Uh, so how would a society look like today if you could start a new based on the new technologies? Okay, so if you would start uh, uh, from scratch, like totally zero, okay, we have all the technologies we have today and start to build up the society and institutions again. They would not be the same. They would look, look totally different, right? So, and the problem is that we cannot get out of this path dependency we are right uh, uh, in right now, so to speak. Okay, so this is the premise, so to speak, uh, of, the, of the question. Um, is there something behind modernity? And um, yeah, let me just see that uh, quickly. So 
Um, okay, let's just start. Uh, okay, I'll just uh, jump into the into the PowerPoint presentation quickly. Wait a second. Can you see the PowerPoint? Uh, moment. Mm. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. So I just took uh, some some older uh, random ones. Okay. So so the whole theory is uh, uh, is based on on uh, Kat, uh, Miriam Heidler's uh, theory, or not theory? She uh, on her on her yeah model. You would say it's not, it's not necessarily a theory. It's a heuristic model to uh, research. Um, yeah, to reconstruct the becoming of human cultural evolution. So this is a theory from from cultural ev evolution, from cognitive archaeology. Uh, these people are trying to reconstruct the evolution of the mind. I mean, we talked about it earlier in in uh, Reza's symbolic, you know, uh, text, so to speak. So th these people are much more fine grained when we uh, when we reconstruct how the ego, so to speak became uh, was structured during uh, during um, evolution so what we are doing is this we are looking at uh, uh, at stone tools and archaeological artifacts and we are deriving uh, what type of cognition is needed to produce these stone tools okay so um, and we do that by reconstructing uh, how much um, how much yeah, so to speak, how much work you have to put into the stone into the production of stone tools. Um, they are they are reconstructing it by um, by by measuring the length of the operational chains involved. Okay, so uh, in order to produce a simple stone tool, uh, the operational chains are smaller than the operational chains uh, than or less than than the operational chains you need to produce a bow and arrow. Okay, so I, I'll just show you this quickly. Okay, yeah, anyway, so, uh, can you see this here? Okay, so these are all the single steps that you need to take to produce a spear with a, with a half that point. Yeah, get, you get the idea? So this is basically, um, it, it is the, it's, it's the cognigram of an effective chain of the production of a spear. So these, uh, all these steps you have to take when you uh, when you want to produce a spear and this is of course obviously much more complicated than if you want to just pr produce a simple uh, a simple stone tool right and uh, if you want to produce a bow and arrow then you need already double as much uh, uh, steps okay so what the cognitive archaeologists are doing they are reconstructing the capacity of the mind to organize actions um, by uh, uh, deriving it from the tools they find. Okay, so we look at the tools and then we derive how, how good or how far could the, could the producer think. All right, so this is the idea. Anyway, so what we find is uh, we find um, four general stages in the evolution of human uh, of humans. In the beginning, you have the modular culture, which is simple stone tools, and then uh, later, three. Uh, in the beginning is 3 million years ago and then 300,000 years ago uh, you uh, find the first composite tools which means tools that are uh, fused by a glue for example by, by some sort of uh, um, adhesive compound um, so where, where, where composite tools means where, uh, yeah, well, composites they are put together from two different tools this is the first time that you find this. And then uh, 100,000 years ago, you find complementary tools, which is like uh, needle and thread or bow and arrow, you know, or, or um, um, a necklace with ornaments. So why is it complementary? Because the one tool is acting on the other tool. So the bow is acting on this on the, on the arrow. Okay, so you have two complementary tools which are independent from each other, but which can be brought together to form one tool, so to speak, or one unit. And then in the end, uh, around 70,000 or uh, 40,000 years ago, um, notional culture appears uh, with uh, notional tools. So notional tools are, for example, cave paintings, uh, music instruments, you know, figurines. Uh, so, so every kind of technology that deals with the mind directly. 
notional tools, right? notional tools for cognitive engineering. Um, so we are, uh, we are, we are used to, um, yeah, to influence the mind basically, or we are acting with the mind. So music, um, so for example, to produce music or use a music instrument means to produce uh, effects in the mind of yourself or in the other, not in nature, but in the mind. And you do it on purpose, right? Because you use the music instrument. And uh, at the same time, also traps appear. Um, so uh, why are traps also notional tools? By the way, can somebody, uh, somebody, can somebody say something to that? Why is, why is, a, nap, uh, why is a trap also a notional tool? So music instruments are dealing with the mind, or we are engineering the mind, and because uh, it know. takes takes the place of the hunter or the yeah. hunter group. Uh, yeah, okay. It, uh, it takes the place of the hunter. Yes, this is it takes the notion of survival. Okay, that's also interesting, and it requires simulation. What does it mean? Uh, it requires simulation. It was a future fourth state. Yes. So we have to understand how the uh, the animal that we want to hunt actually functions. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're you're dealing with the mind. You're basically also tricking the animal, right? With camouflage, uh, you are looking at uh, uh, how the animal behaves and what the animal sees and doesn't see, basically, right? So you put a trap where it cannot see the trap. So you put yourself into the mind of the animal and you're basically, um, yeah, indirectly. Um, yeah, uh, they are dealing with 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 the with the psyche of the of the animal. Okay. Anyway, so. Um, but also, okay, so yes. Phenomenological possibilities. Hmm? We are also dealing with the uh, phenomenological possibilities of an animal because if if you want to uh, catch, let's say, uh, a what we will build a trap that the wasp uh, will not have the possibility to actually uh, see that it can't come out or something like that. We will not build it in a way that uh, the wasp uh, can possibly discern that this is a trap. Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. So uh, somebody says parallels to Razor's identification with the alien. Yeah. Um, th that's why I'm saying we, we have to discuss this a little bit uh, later, if it's okay. But yes, it's uh, th there are some similarities. Um, okay, so it, it just uh, just as a little, let's continue with the, um, anyway, so now if you look at uh, the, the history of technology, the, so we see, uh, so I don't have time to do this now, if you read the text, you see if you know what layers of integration and recursion are. So if you look at uh, these stages, the cultural capacity stages, then it's not only that the operational chains are extending, but there is, uh, 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 there are several principles or overarching logics, so to speak, how these develop. Um, so, uh, for one, is uh, that every new level is a higher level of integration for the previous uh, uh, performances. So, um, all the technologies or, or all the steps or the operational chains that are used for modular culture tools are being. Um, are being uh, integrated in the next stage. So, so to produce a composite tool, you need to know how to produce a modular tool and and plus the composite tool, right? So it's a, so you can say there's an integration of the um, okay. So uh, wait a second. So there's a discussion going on in the group chat. <laughs> is it uh, is it something for me? Externalization of agency with concomitant vertigo of alterity. Oh, it's a parallel again. Okay, yeah, okay, let's talk about the parallels later. So, um, uh, all right, so the, anyway, so if you look at, at, at history, you see these stages and uh, these stages are, uh, um, are, they can be defined by, by, uh, by distinct or discrete layers of integration or by the principle of recursion, which is now not going to be explained. What is important is, that every layer, every new layer, which can be discreetly uh, distinguished, brings forth a new type of ontology, uh, a new type of metaphysics. Uh, let's, let's talk, for example, about ontology. So imagine the composite culture um, 
with the with the with the composite tools where for the first time glue is being used right so uh, there is a world without glue without the concept of glue okay so i know that animals sometimes you know like bees they glue <laughs> they use glue when they build their their, their hives and so on uh, but it's not that we have a concept of glue as we have a concept of glue so at some point all of a sudden a totally new concept appears and that, that is glue to glue things together to make something new right to make a new object like we learned in kindergarten or uh, as children to take two different things and pull them together and say okay now this is one object Okay, so so this concept of gluing, for example, is a new type of ontology which just appears all of the time, all of the sudden. Um, yeah, well, not not totally chaotic. Anyway, so uh, and and the, the depth of time and uh, uh, and the structure of time is changing with every um, with every layer. We have new events like gluing, for example, new materiality, new body relations uh, to also so relations to ourselves, new understandings of the human body. So it's a different difference uh, if I can use a bow and arrow or if I never heard of a bow and arrow right because I have to uh, move my body in a different um, uh, in, in a different way and um, okay so new cognitive structures appearing new materials uh, new types of agent uh, agent agency and uh, new types of division and labor and new types of institutions okay so the, the question is now uh, does this continue in history in later history and um, okay so this process uh, is continuing. So if you look at that, then we see that uh, in civilizational history, uh, we can also distinguish exactly the same type of stages. Um, um, yeah. Uh, so, so we can see exactly the same types of stages. So we have the, the beginning of writing and sciences in, in the early cultures like Egypt and Mesopotamia, and then in the axial age, uh, between 800 and 200, uh, we have the introduction of the coin, so coin money, of the alphabet, uh, of uh, isonomia, which means uh, equality in politics, so to speak, um, logos, absolute truth, I mean, philosophy in general, and deductive math and uh, mathematics and, and formal formal mathematics and uh, the proof in mathematics and philosophy. So there's a distinct, there's a distinct shift in, in the axial age. And then again, we have a distinct shift in modernity, uh, when capital and science and print, you know, and the central perspective and constitutions appear and the new type of mathematics appears uh, and, and so on, right? The mechanistical worldview and so on. So these are stages uh, which are known, so to speak. So uh, there's no, there's no, you know, there's no debate about, uh, about, um, yeah, that these are, that these are like uh, breaks or shifts, shifts in civilization. So the, the point is now, if you analyze these shifts in, um, in civilizational history, that means in the last uh, 5,000 years, so to speak, then you find the same pattern as in early uh, evolution. Okay, so this is the basic idea. And maybe now you see already where this is going. Now that we know the pattern, well we can derive if we are again uh, right now in a new uh, in a new uh, um, shift so to speak if there's a new shift so in other words is the technology is the technological civilization again a new shift so are we just at the beginning of a new phase just like modernity was 500 years ago or uh, what uh, 500 or 700 years ago are we just at the beginning of a new axial age basically okay so this is what we can do and um, by applying the pattern that we derived from history and that would mean that um, yeah that would mean that we are just in the beginning of a change of a shift of institutions of economies of a new type of thinking uh, a new type of cognitive structure a new type of temporality uh, and so on and so on okay so this is the yeah a little bit I hope I hope not too chaotic introduction uh, to my 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 to the to the basic. So this is the basic idea. This was the introduction to the basic idea of my work and of the text that I gave you today um, to read. So um, I will take a short break. I have more um, 
PowerPoint presentations to show you. We can also focus a little bit on modernity and money, but I would uh, like to take a break for a moment and ask you if you have questions so far, or if we should discuss something that was written in the in the chat section. Okay, Erkin, uh, Ikin Erkan has a question. Yes, so you're not using this term, and, and I sort of asked this question, I, I know you have good reason, you're not using this term post-modernity quite intentionally, I assume. And, you know, Lyotard sort of uh, coined that post-modernity is a stool of, of meta-narratives. So whether it be Marxism, whether it be subjectivity as found in the art of, of modernism, uh, post-modernity is a rejection of all these meta-narratives in favor for a sort of a, a skeptical subject position. Um, and, I'm, and I'm curious whether you're sort of unfolding some of the, uh, some of the, Reappropriation that is associated with postmodernity, maybe aesthetically, some of the uh, skepticism that's associated with intellectual postmodernity under technological civilization, or whether you see some type of uh, of different rupture that technological civilization uh, occupies, and it's it's a different periodization than what's traditionally associated with postmodernity. Uh, that's the point. Postmodernity is the technological civilization. Okay. Uh, so it started, this is the first phase, uh, this is the active uh, passive informationalism. Uh, so, okay, I understand your question. Um, I would, <laughs> it's a long, um, okay, let, let me say like this. So first of all, uh, yeah, sure, the postmodernists thought that this is the end of the narratives, right? But um, of course, postmodernity itself is a meta-narrative. What else would it be uh, than that? So obviously humans reached a post of modernity, and this is obviously uh, temporal. <laughs> so, so there's no, there, there's uh, there's no, uh, you know, it's it's illogical. So it, it became an, an ideology and so on. So, but it's not what I'm talking about here. So, but, but I'm I'm looking at the type of thought itself. Um, so po postmodernity um, needs to be understood as the beginning of the technological civilization uh, because the. Not because they say, so not because the postmodernists say that now everything is relative, but because in fact everything became relative. Okay, so why did it become relative? Uh, wait a second, I can show you this. I have a, uh, actually I have a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> I have a picture and then you will see what, what, what the point is. So um, modernity was, uh, so to speak, all about this mechanistical worldview and this central perspective of what where you can every, put everything in a coordinate system, right? So we have this one unit, uh, this, this one unified universe uh, that is protruded by homogeneous natural laws, like, um, you know, everywhere the same, so to speak. So you have this big coordinate system th that ends in this mechanical clockwork uh, universe, so to speak. Um, it's one continuum. So what is happening now around 1870 um, is that that this continuum is fragmentizing into many little tiny systems. Okay, so before that we had one, uh, so to speak, container space, which was homogeneously um, uh, li like, uh, uh, like, like in a grid, how do you say this, uh, graded, li like, you know, like a grid, basically, like a 3D grid. Um, and everything was uh, um, consistent, so to speak, causally and uh, physically consistent. And in the moment, uh, when the tech, when when electricity appeared, basically, um, when the machine started, when the machine started to communicate among each other, they started to fan out own grids, own little systems. Okay, so I, I show you this. Uh, uh, I can I can explain this with an example that is, um, uh, I think, for example. So with a microscope, uh, you can still see bacteria. Right, so it's not no problem. So the, this is basically modernity, uh, sixteen whatever, sixteen thirty or something. The, the microscope was was invented and started to being used. And you look at it, and you can so to speak scale down to the little microbes and so on, and you can uh, scale them up again into our perceptual reality through the microscope, through the lens. Okay, so this is still, uh, um, so this is still how should I say, mm, it is mediated, but not. Uh, but it's first order mediated, so to speak. So it's still in 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 the causal grid, in the causal mechanistical grid. So you scale it up and you can scale it down. Okay. So, but uh, what what's happening after 1870 is that we have several technologies in a row before we can see 
what uh, uh, what's happening in the lower levels. Okay, let's say for example uh, atoms, or, or let's say uh, electron microscope or something like this. So uh, you don't you you are not directly connected through a lens to the small um, element, so to speak, that you want to observe. Uh, but there is one layer of technology uh, enhancing or amplifying another layer of technology and then another layer of technology and another layer of technology. And then you will see what you see for an electron mi a microscope. Does it make sense what, what I'm saying so far? Yes. So, so you have mediated layers of... of, of um, and now the point is this, depending on the constitution of the connected layers of technology, you will see something else. Right, so it really depends on uh, 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 how the how the how the system is so to sp the, the technological system is made uh, that mediates what it's what it itself seemingly produces. Right, so and um, so in other words, uh, uh, all of the sudden world what we consider as true or not depends on the system that shows us what we can see. All right, not with the microscope because it was still uh, uh, our very own eyes. We could still have a subject. Uh, 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 so to speak, confirming what it sees, right? But uh, uh, starting from 1817 on, uh, we have a new layer of technology that mediates mediates the world to us. Yeah, and in this moment, uh, the whole constructivism, cybernetics, relativism starts. Okay, because from this moment on, we are not directly or immediately uh, connected to the world anymore, like by one step, like in modernity, uh, but through layers of technology, and this is postmodernity. Okay, this is it. That's why Nietzsche, why, why Nietzsche uh, is called, you know, the first, first postmodernist, uh, because we simply knew that uh, in this moment the subject is not uh, in the center of the world anymore. It cannot be in the in the center of the world anymore because it's not guaranteeing that um, um, uh, it, it cannot guarantee that what's true is true, so to speak. Uh, and then at the same time, of course, we start uh, understanding the whole world uh, uh, as a system or everything as a system. In this moment, also the body becomes a system, right? So uh, uh, if, if you imagine what we know today about all the processes that are happening in the mind when you see something, right? So you have light coming to, uh, getting through the, uh, how to say this, uh, uh, the, the lens uh, of the eye, getting into the, to the retina, then you have a chemical process. This chemical process is uh, transforming into a physiological process through neurons. And then the neurons, you know, go to the brain and do something here and do something there and so on. So in other words, even the human itself uh, now is becoming rendered as a system, right? So so this is this uh, postmodern view. And, um, and now that we know that, that all systems are constructing their own reality, I mean, we, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but um, uh, uh, the system can only see what it can see, so to speak. You cannot, uh, Patrick said it earlier, we, we cannot see infrared, for example, right? So we are constructing our world to a certain degree. Um, so, uh, and, and in, the, in this moment, uh, postmodernity starts basically. So this is the, this is the, this is the basis of, uh, of postmodernity and of, of postmodern relativism. At least in the first half of the uh, of the twentieth uh, second half of the of the twentieth century, with of course predecessors in the in the beginning, the whole twentieth century. If you look at philosophy, it starts uh, with with this whole, uh, also builds on this whole idea. Uh, if, if you think of Wittgenstein, is of course a constructivist take. Uh, uh, if, if you think of Heidegger um, and others uh, at this time, this is all constructivism. This is all proto constructivism and or pro proto cybernetics basically and um, anyway so this was the 20th century and then yeah of course media theory everything is a construct uh, construct through media and, and so on um, so there's no absolute truth anymore everything is just a system construct and uh, now I'm claiming that uh, since 2001 to be more or less precise we are shifting into a new stage okay so in the whole 20th century uh, was was so to speak this um, constructivist everything is made up everything is uh, system relative um, uh, uh, phase uh, which i call the passive informationalism that is we know about systems okay so we know about systems we know that we, we can render everything by a system but we don't know yet how to produce them or, or how to influence them okay we are just about to discover systems so this was the 20th century about so you know the first wave of cybernetics second wave and then virtuality and so on. And uh, so the next step is after we have understood 
systems that they exist, so to speak, right? After we have isolated them in the world, uh, now the next logical step is, of course, uh, to produce them, to 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 uh, influence them, right? Uh, you know the term nudging, right? Uh, nudging, uh, which became famous in the last, let's say, 10 years or something like this. Nudging means uh, that you accept that uh, that other, uh, uh, yeah, how should I say, that, that systems are autopoetic and, and that we are self-determined in what we do, like whatever, children are systems, right? So, <laughs> so you cannot determine what we will do. We will do whatever we like to do, or humans or, or whatever. But you can nudge them. You can uh, give them a little tip and hope that they will develop in a certain direction. Okay, so this is... Um, uh, uh, this is this is um, yeah this is this new moment uh, that can be called active informationalism and this is the end of the whole postmodernity. So why? Because we have a new moment of realism again here in uh, involved in here. Why? Uh, if there wouldn't be a realism, I couldn't nudge or change the system, right? I couldn't uh, if there wasn't something real, I couldn't influence the genes of a baby. I couldn't produce a designer baby, for example. Okay, you see my point. So, so, so there's some reality coming back. So the systems may internally still construct their own world, but obviously they can be pushed, so to speak, to go in, in or, or made, so to speak. And um, in this phase of uh, active informationalism, yeah, all the postmodern uh, notions are kind of uh, not disappearing. They're simply not valid. But it doesn't mean that they are. Um, so it, it means that we have to go. Uh, how should I say this? Yeah, you know, it's like Wittgenstein says. Um, you have to climb up the ladder and then toss it away. So you have to go through postmodernism, but then toss it away to get to this new uh, perspective, so to speak. So in other words, uh, uh, now we are now with the distance to postmodernity, we can explain why it appeared, where it comes from, what it was, and we can move on. Okay. So this is the um, was this <laughs> this was an uh, attention uh, yeah, was a long long answer to. Uh, well, was, thank you. But that opens, that opens up another question, yeah. which is, okay, so we're describing different machines and different technologies in terms of modalities, but also in terms of recursion, right? So you have these compound machines, mm -hmm. and these compound machines developing in a more or less progressive or linear manner defines modernity. But mm -hmm. then as we're able to develop higher order recursive schematics of these machines, and as soon as perspective becomes more scalar, then you have this kind of postmodern crisis of your observations and your epistemological outlook is going to depend on where in this recursive schematic, on which kind of level you stand. Okay, so we've gone recursively to including these compound machines within a greater schematic. And now you're saying, okay, we're going to proceed from this kind of postmodern multi scalar schematic to something new. And we're going to figure out how we're going to overcome modernity. But my question is, if this is a recursive model, you can't actually jettison modernity or the compound machines for this kind of new active infor uh, informatic approach, because the compound machines and modernity are still there mm -hmm. at a certain scale, right? At a certain, um, uh, you know, card and ordinal within this kind of... Uh, uh, tr you know, transfinite system. So we can move on from modernity to postmodernity to something else, but those kernels will still be in there. So how do you account for mm. that? Yeah, that's a, actually a nice and a good <laughs> question. Um, yeah, this is the point. Uh, I, I actually, I remember, I think in the text I wrote, nothing is ever lost, right? So yeah, it's true. So so we are, we are building up uh, that is that is true, but they can detach uh, from uh, from the compound machine. So, uh, for example, in the beginning of modernity, we had also an overlap of basically antique production uh, structures. Like, for example, um, so today we don't have slaves anymore. In modernity, they they kind of uh, disappeared. They were exchanged by by something else. But in antiquity, the slaves were the main, uh, so to speak, means of production. But they disappeared then in modernity slowly. So it's, you know there was a how to say this uh, you know the, the one came and the other disappeared slowly. Um, and uh, so does the does the compound machine disappear? No, no, it, uh, it's okay. It's, uh, the compound machine can stay, but there's a new level, level so to speak, forming above the compound machine. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, actually, I don't. Maybe I didn't understand the question. I don't see that as problematic because uh, just as the simple machine from antiquity doesn't disappear, 
uh, the compound machine also will not disappear. It cannot disappear. Um, now, yeah, I mean, think about uh, what would happen if we would uh, shift maybe to bioengineering and start producing, like helping animals or something like this. You know, they don't have any, they don't have a mind or something like this. So which are which is which are ethically okay to be used. Yeah. But which which would only be possible through um, information technology to organize. Okay, so what I'm proposing just, I mean, I'm making this up now, it's, it's nonsense, but uh, I'm proposing this. So you're saying, uh, I'm saying it is, it is possible to think that uh, compound machines uh, might themselves disappear by bioengineering some type of slave animal that doesn't have a mind, but does everything you need it to do. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but, but it would be only possible through, uh, um, you know, to organize all the actions through information technology. <laughs> okay, I mean, it's nonsense, but, uh, but I'm saying, uh, but, but I'm saying it's, it's uh, thinkable that, that, that the compound machine disappears, but not the principle, you see. Um, uh, how should I say, uh, when, uh, whenever you have uh, the, the information level, you can always go down to the compound machine level. It is, so to speak, uh, abstractively integrated or folded into the information. You know, just like the, uh, just like uh, if you have a compound machine, you can always go back down to the level of the simple machine, because it's as a principle it is involved, right? But not necessarily materialized. I'm not sure if this was an answer. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, if, if you don't agree, just say, you know, <laughs> maybe, maybe I understood something wrong. I mean, it's not that I'm, it's just, you know, theory. We are making up things here, so to speak. It's no. Hmm. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Any other questions? Yeah, I got a question. Hmm? Uh, can you go over again how kind of the age of active informationalism kind of provides an avenue to kind of ground a real. You're saying that nudging ability to the, manipulate the genetics of a baby thereby mm -hmm. opens an avenue to ground us in like a realism. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay, this is complicated. If you want to look at look this up more in detail, uh, this was part of my first uh, seminar here in the in the news center. It was just the opening of the whole thing. So um, uh, I think from 2017 or something, I can send you the link, uh, whatever. Anyway, so this is, so why does it ground us in a new realism? Um, um, okay, let, let me think. So it's, it's a different type of realism. Uh, let, let me just, you know what? I'll show you a PowerPoint presentation. This is uh, a <laughs> question. Wait a uh, I have a, this is maybe the easiest way to explain uh, what, what, I, what I mean by that. Um, it's a yeah, sure. It's a complicated, wait a second. For the... uh, Patrick, sorry, am I taking too much time? Are we okay? No, no, it's perfect. I mean, I took, 40 minutes, I think, so. Okay. Think you're, 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 okay, okay. Now, now listen, now I'll show you something special. Um, okay, so here it is. Okay, so um, what do I mean now with, with this new type of realism? It's a little bit complicated to wrap your mind around it, but once you see it, you know, you're lost forever, <laughs> so to speak, for, for, for any postmodernity and any other kind of realism, but uh, I'll show you now. Um, um, okay, wait a second. <laughs> I have to um, share this. Okay, so this is a little experiment. Uh, it's an easy experiment. You will just tell me if you can solve the, the riddle. Okay, so um, you have uh, two distances. Can you see my mouse actually? Wait a second, I have to see. Oh, yeah, there it is. Okay, so you have uh, two, dis uh, two, uh, two lengths uh, of uh, two distances of different lengths. So on the, le on the left side, you have um, the starting point A. And on the right side, you have the starting point B of two distances that two runners have to take. Uh, okay, why, why am I uh, explaining this so complicated? So you ask two people uh, to run uh, these distances. The one is uh, shorter, the other is longer, okay? So the one starts at starting point A, the other at B. So now the, the question is this, A and B both start at the same time 
so we start simultaneously and we reach the goal simultaneously. Okay, so now, now is the question, which one was faster? So who was running faster, A or B? Uh, yeah, I'm asking you, I, I know you're grown up people, but I don't know. <laughs> A, right? Uh, Okay, okay, A, why? Yeah. Because, uh, uh, it, yeah, I mean, it's clear, uh, because it uh, had to uh, run a longer distance in a shorter time, right? So now the interesting thing is, uh, when you ask children, uh, let's say, below the age of eight, or seven, or six, or something, then they couldn't give the answer. They would say, no, of course, uh, B was faster. But because, uh, be, uh, for example, right, we would, so it would be random, we would say A or B, but we couldn't explain why we uh, would say it's A or B. Okay, so in other words, this capacity is something that you develop later and uh, usually also only in school to do that. Because why, why is that? What, what do you have to do here? So what is the problem? Why, why cannot children, why, can, why have children trouble to, to, to understand it, the concept or the whole concept? So why is this? What do you have to do to know who was faster? Yeah, the concept of velocity, uh, somebody says. Uh, yeah, you have to know distance uh, through time. Okay, so what is your perspective? Yeah, it's abstract, right? So you have to abstract from the, the from the action of running, right? You have to abstract uh, the whole space itself, and you have uh, do you have to you have to have a concept of time itself. And now you have to bring them all together in your head, right? As abstract uh, uh, concepts, so speed and time uh, and space. And relate them to each other. Uh, okay, so this is this is a complex uh, this is a complex thing that um, that that is difficult uh, to learn, so to speak. So we, we learn this in modern societies. We learn this in school. So now the interesting thing is this: uh, if you go uh, to pre-modern cultures, like pre-Newtonian cultures, uh, wait a second, I'll make it a little bit bigger. If you go to pre-Newtonian cultures and do the same experiment, they cannot solve it. Okay, so if you go to the Amazonas, for example, or if you go to Indian um, uh, Indian tribes, uh, I mean in India or in Russia, in Siberia or something like this, or in Africa, you give them the same task, uh, they cannot solve it. Like I mean, I mean literally this task. Uh, so if you, uh, so they would come up with stories like. Um, so you could ask them, okay, but uh, so they would say, for example, B was faster, um, was run, was running faster. And then you would ask, yeah, but how is it possible then if he was running faster uh, that um, that that they were reaching the goal at the same time? So you can ask them. And then uh, they would make up stories like, okay, I know uh, he was probably hiding behind the tree. And in the moment when A came, he jumped into the, you know, he jumped into the goal. Okay, so so we are making up stories to explain what we cannot explain formally or abstractly. So to say. No, 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 we understand the question. So Hernan, Hernan is asking if we are understanding the question at all. I know, of course, this would be the question if our modern biases, uh, you know, like uh, if we are projecting them, uh, if, if we are asking them questions that we don't understand. No, no, we understand it. Th this is exactly the point uh, what, we, uh, what we try to show uh, with this experiment. So uh, look, look at this experiment, uh, please. So you have... Um, what you can see is a cow uh, walking in a circle around a millstone. Okay, makes sense. Uh, James is asking without the modern concept of force. No, no, uh, no, faster means to run faster. I, I don't think that children uh, have the concept of force when we learn how to faster. Uh, so, so. No, they know, they know what it means to run faster but mm -hmm. as soon as you try and render it diagrammatic the way that you're drawing it instead of just seeing someone run faster you know, then these the... newtonian notions of force come about i yes, think that's yes. what herman's trying to add uh yeah but this is later this is very much later so we are we are here so these are different stages so the one is called concrete operational okay running with the body would be concrete operational uh, the, the 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 diagrammatic picture would be abstract uh, or formal operational this is a later level that you have to learn also okay so force yeah okay you're, you're correct so force would come even later we are still at the moment we are still where we are we are still in the moment of co cognitive development so to speak where we speak about concrete relations so to speak but we will get to that in a, in a moment. Um, 
No, no. Uh, so uh, Ekin asks, no, no. We understand the question. So this is exactly what, what I'm what I'm uh, trying to uh, to. So you ask him the following question. So um, you you have this uh, circle in which a cow is uh, walking around uh, the millstone. Okay, you can understand that. And this is a technology which is exactly used by them, uh, by 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 this Indian tribe. So we know we are familiar. Uh, we know exactly what 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 the, the model is about, so to speak. So this is this is the idea to model the same question in their life world, so to speak, in, in their reality. So you have two different uh, circles or two different radiuses. You can see the inner radius, right, and you can see the outer radius. And now you have two cows. You see cow number one, and here in the back you can see cow number two. Yeah, you see this. So and now both are being moved, as you can see here with the stick. Uh, simultaneously, like oops, uh, like uh, like once, like like in a circle, right? And now, of course, the question is the same: which car was running faster? Yeah, the outside car is right. <laughs> uh, was running faster, of course, because um, uh, because uh, yeah, uh, because it's a longer distance. Okay, so again, same question. And uh, this has been proven, proven over and over again. It's not that we don't understand the question. On the contrary, uh, there is a certain percentage of people who can answer it correctly. Okay, so let's say 20% uh, approximately of the grown-ups can answer it correctly. In our society, the children already are developing these capacities around uh, five, six, seven years. Uh, and and uh, there in, in the other cultures, it's only yeah, as I said, uh, uh, only twenty percent of the, of the grown-ups who can answer the, the question correctly. Okay, so this is of course nothing to do with genetical differences or something like this, but simply with uh, what the culture is teaching you. So what we are, what we are grown up with, um, with with school and so on. So we learn this in school. Basically, to develop these capacities is what we do in school. And if you don't have a school, if you live in a tribe. Of 50 people who doesn't have writing, who doesn't have money, you know, uh, you know, that doesn't have the technology and so on. These capacities are simply not being developed. They don't need it. It's good enough to understand the world as it is. You know, you, there's no need for abstraction. There is no need for, as we said earlier, so to speak, mental diagrammatization and, and, and so on. Okay. Anyway, so what I want to say is this. Um, so we have these stages uh, called for, uh, in, in ontogenesis. This is a simplification a little bit. So today uh, things are a little bit more complex, but you can see that. Um, okay, sorry, there's a question again. Um, but when we are asked about speed, we sometimes understand the speed of reaching a goal regardless of the actual absolute distance. Uh, yeah, exactly exactly yes uh so yeah yeah true okay you can you can say that um but you can clarify this so if you if you really do the experiment the experimenters uh, use different methods you know to make sure that uh, that that it's really understood or they say it was not understood yeah. the, uh, this is one thing uh but the other thing yeah that's that's exactly correct so this is called the action uh, uh so in german handlungs how how did he call it handlungskognition Handlungszeit, I think Handlungszeit. So uh, this is uh, this is the action. What you're describing here is uh, you are using a analog or concrete reference system to define speed, and not a formal reference system. Yeah, and you are saying that um, that, that that maybe when you go to the early cultures, they are also using this analog and not a formal system, so to speak. Uh, so we, we understand speed as something different. Yeah, that's true. But this is exactly the point. We cannot step into the formal system. Yeah. Not because we are stupid, not because we are genetically inferior, but because we did not develop this formal thinking. Okay, so I mean, I can give you billions of literature on this. I mean, I know that, uh, that many people don't like this because it's uh, political incorrect to say uh, that these uh, that these cultures have um, different cognitive abilities, but it's simply obvious. I mean, it's absolutely clear. There is no doubt about it. And but it doesn't mean that we are inferior. It just means that we are adapted to a certain reality, just as we are adapted to a certain reality, right? So just as we couldn't function uh, in in their reality uh, in the in the jungle, for example, uh, they couldn't function in our reality in in high highly modern, you know, technologized uh, reality. So to speak, this is um, 
Uh, anyway, okay, so what I wanted to say is this. Can you follow me so far, or is it? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, then, uh, then let's just quickly. So we are still in the question <laughs> of uh, where's the new realism? Okay, so. Uh, okay, wait a second. I have an idea. Mm. Okay, there's the idea. Um, okay, so the new realism is here. Wait a second. So if you look now at at the reality. Okay, I have a new PowerPoint presentation, which I will show you now. Um, yeah. Okay, so so this uh, so these studies show that, 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 that there are different cognitions in different uh, cultures. So we are not all the same. Like maybe maybe it's a symbol, maybe it's a simplification in Razor's text that there is a mind which is always the same, the ego, you know, like which does things or something like this. No, I mean, if you look at history, you see that, that the cognitive structures are constantly changing and, and modern philosophy and reflection are a totally new or different type than than, than other types of uh, thought. Anyway, so, uh, so what we see is that these uh, early pre-Newtonian cultures, uh, they have not developed uh, ab abstract categories like um, uh, or object classifications or terms for dimensions. So we don't have words for like what we call today liter, you know, like or gallon or something like this. Like we don't have dimensional terms. That doesn't mean that we are not measuring things, but we don't have these abstract terms. Um, yeah, okay, sentience and sapience. Uh, Yeah, uh, I would say that uh, there must be even more distinctions than, than only two distinctions between uh, sentience and sapience. Uh, anyway, but a uh, long story. Um, uh, yeah, I understand the point. So sapience is something different than sentience, but but even even that must be discussed. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. So um, so we have different types of uh, what we know now is that we have a different type of. By the way, James, uh, would that be? These structures that I'm describing would they be sentience or sapience? So the, the capacity, uh, the capacity to to define a liter or to define speed would that be sentience or sapience? There would be well, sentience, right? This so this it's from uh, Nagarastani's Labor of the Inhuman, and mm -hmm. I think that that would probably be under sapience. But what he's describing in terms of predator prey that would probably go under sentience. sentience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Just uh, right. Anyway. Okay. So now we are. Let's. Okay. Then let's just say we are. We are now in the register of looking at the changes and the morphisms on the level of the sapiens. I, I don't think that this distinction sentience and sapiens is useful, but uh, let's just uh, you know play with that a little bit. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, uh, anyway. So. Um, okay. So now what I want to say is this, actually. No, this is an old. Uh, okay, I wanted to show you something, but it, it didn't work. Anyway, so what, um, let me just go get, get back again here for a moment. So th this was from an old, um, um, is everybody familiar with Meiyasu? With the, with the archifossil and so on? Yeah. Okay, well, then I could have shown, uh, shown this to you quickly. Okay, so the, um, wh what I wanted to show you this, uh, why I think that the realism of Miyasu failed and uh, why there must be another type of realism is this, um, if it comes at some point. Am I here? What's happening? Can you see anything? No, no, that can only see your face. <laughs> is it frozen or <laughs> does it move? Uh, okay, something is something went wrong. I think I have to restart the browser because I cannot. Um, okay, it's okay. Sorry, I'll be back in a second. Okay, since we have now well, lost the world for a second, uh, are there any uh, questions or remarks that any of you want to formulate while he is? gone and starts, restarts his browser. OK, 
Okay. So, uh, so uh, Hutch asks uh, if anybody got a quick rundown on Mersu's uh, uh, realism. So, quick rundown. I'm not quite prepared to, to, to do that right now. Uh, is anybody here uh, uh, familiar, as, as familiar uh, enough to just do a, a spot-on presentation uh, without uh, preparation? Um, I, I've taught a little bit on Quentin Rosso. I think I might be able to clarify a little bit and someone else can jump in. Um, so. Melso, he's uh, sort of associated with speculative realism. This uh, this movement is one of the forefathers uh, of it, and he he uh, doesn't make explicit distinctions between uh, philosophy of science and uh, his rejection, sort of of, uh, of a metaphysics model. Um, he believes that uh, that re by reinterpreting scientific statements according to particular philosophical agendas, uh, philosophers should take science at a face value. Sort of working from this tradition uh, that uh, Laurel and non-philosophy a rejection of, uh, of the transcendental decision by Kant. Um, so this is to say, among other things, that uh, you know what science says is indeed the last word about what it says. Um, so this realist construal of science uh, adds that what fidelity to science requires, the scientific statements are not merely true for us, for they do not refer to a reality as a project of the subject-object dialogue or any other correlationist trope. They refer to a reality absolutely untethered from thought. Exactly. Am I back again? Yes, you're back again. Uh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I think this was the, a beautiful, uh, you know, <laughs> precise and apt description of um, of Mayor Su. Um, and this is exactly something I want to question, and, and uh, I'll show you why. So, look, um, is it going to work this time? Yes, okay. So, uh, we have... Exactly. So uh, this is what uh, Mayor Su goes against, the weak correlationism and the strong correlationism. Um, okay, so his idea uh, is, actually I don't know the name who was just speaking, who was this Ikin, right? Yes. Uh, yep. Who was just introducing the, the uh, Mayor Su. Okay, so... Um, uh, so yeah, exactly. So his argument is basically that you can see, uh, you know, that, that there must be something outside of the subject. So you have to choose if you if you want to. Uh, um, yeah, basically you can make the decision if you want to take, um, if you want to believe in science or not. But he is asking you, was there not something before you, so to speak, uh, before the subject? So there must have been the humans. Then there must have been life before the subject and Earth in the beginning of the planet, right? So in other words. Uh, uh, yeah, and this is the call, this is what he calls the arche fossil or ancestrality. So there must be something. Uh, in, I mean, it's it's kind of dogmatic because it still could be constructed. So you have to make a decision. You have to make the decision if you believe this or not. If you believe it, then you have to go to science, right? so to speak. Uh, am I simplifying? Ah, I don't know. Anyway, so uh, outside of the constructive subject, you have uh, several objects that you uh, can see in his realism as true, or they exist, or you have to you have to admit that they are true, so to speak. So now the point is this: uh, when we look at uh, the history of humanity, so to speak, if we, when we look at the history of ideas and cognitions, then we see obviously that not every human has the same kind of cognition. Okay. So this is uh, not every culture produces the same kind of cognition, and not every uh, everybody has the same kind of, kind of cognitive capacities. So, like as we said, the pre-Newtonian cultures, uh, they don't have uh, these abstract uh, notions and concepts. I mean, literally, they don't have them. It doesn't mean that the body cannot have it. It doesn't mean that we are genetically incapable of. It just means that we did not, we, we haven't developed them as a culture. Okay. So now the point is this. If you look at uh, Mayor Su's um, archifossil, then you see that this is basically uh, science. Everything is science. So this whole, this whole thing is uh, just uh, um, a, a scientific, so to speak, worldview. So in other words, the archifossil by which he philosophically grounds 
uh, the the realism is basically the same concept uh, as for example dna or molecules or molecules or, or let's say other other theorems um does it make sense so far no, what I'm saying. So what I'm saying is this: uh, he's pointing at us at objects that are, so to speak, outside of the subject that must have been there outside of the subject. And he's pointing at science. Okay. So he's pointing at the beginning of the universe, uh, at the beginning of humans, of the beginning of the biosphere, for example. But uh, the beginning of this archaeofossil is exactly the same realm of objects like the DNA, for example. Does it make sense? So uh, do you understand what, what, what I want to say? Remember earlier when we said that we, we have new uh, levels of, um, uh, we have levels of mediated technology. So remember when, when we said that uh, for starting from 1817, uh, the, 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 the uh, human, humans are mediating reality with layers of technology built and built upon each other, right? How do we know, for example, about the Big Bang? How do we know about evolution? at the beginning of humans. Uh, how do we know uh, about the beginning of Earth? Why? Because technology, certain apparatuses, certain instruments uh, translated it to us, so to speak. Okay. And the depth of this, of the uh, coupled uh, instruments that are showing us the, um, the beginning of the universe, like the Big Bang or something like this, is exactly the same as the instruments that we need to show us the DNA for example, or molecules. Does it make sense? Does somebody understand what I'm trying to say so far? Yes. What, so what I'm saying is uh, that his whole theory is basically built, so his idea how he argues for realism is basically itself a cultural construct. Yeah. So he's, he's basing it on a reality which is rendered in a certain technological stage. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> do, you, do you see my point? Um, so the, 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 the point is that his whole argument of his realism uh, uh, that, that is outside that he finds, that is the DNA and molecules and what he ever wants to believe in, is only translated into our reality as a realism through a certain uh, complexity of technology. Okay, so in other words, he, uh, his reality is itself a construct. It, uh, so what do I mean by that? I'll uh, show you quickly. Um, Okay, so back to the so so this whole idea with the archaeofossil, which uh, which proves that there must be something before the subject, is basically modernist thinking. Um, still, wait a second. I have to see this. Okay, so now if you look at history, remember uh, you remember the um, our good friends the 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 operational chains. Wait a second. Here, where is it? Hmm. Um, uh, where was that again? Um, wait a second, I have to check this for a moment. Dum -dum -dum. So you remember this earlier, um, the stages of technology and the mind. Okay. So, sorry, I cannot find it now. annoying i apologize a lot yeah here it is uh, so so you remember the stages so you remember the stages of the mind right so we have obviously different types of stages and different types of realities uh glue uh, only appears in the composite culture and before that glue did not exist in the in the universe as a principle as a potential yes but not actualized so to speak okay and at the same time we have also a new type of um, a new type of cognition appearing like with every stage again and again and again and the same goes uh, if you continue this in uh, in civilizational history you see that uh, in every stage a new type of um, of cognition is appearing and new type of uh, uh, realities are appearing so for example in modernity you have i don't know uh, 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 ch chemistry, you know, like chemical products, uh, uh, gunpowder or something like this, right? Uh, or later than, 
uh, yeah, and, and later plastics and so on in the technological civilization. Okay, so in other words, you have with every stage, you have not only a new type of cognition, but also a new type of uh, reality being unfolded, un unfolded, so to speak, which wasn't there before. Okay, and so what I'm saying here is this, that if you look now at um, at history, yeah, if you look now at this, uh, at, at the stages in history, then you can say like uh, 2000 years ago, there was a historical type of subject object, object relation A, so a certain reality, right, a certain cognition, a certain uh, materiality, so to speak. And then 500 years or 1000 years later, you have a new type of cognition and a new type of reality with new forces and, and uh, uh, you know, and, and um, materialities are being revealed, which weren't there even before. Okay. And then uh, let's say 1000 years later, again, you have a new historical type of reality appearing, a new type of subject ob object relation. So, um, um, so in other words, the only thing that is real is not what uh, every individual in every stage considers as real, but the shifts between uh, the, 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 the constructions, the shifts between the realities. Does it make any sense? So in other words, we are always confined to our cultural viewpoints, so to speak, to our technical viewpoints, to what our technology is helping us to render in every moment, always. There's no other way because we are you know, connected uh, with, with these things. But these are, uh, these are changing with, uh, with time, so to speak. So, uh, and, and therefore you have like uh, different types of reality constructs, one after the other, all right? And Yes, yes, it's similar to Heidegger. Um, so he, he uh, so somebody is asking if this is the same, like uh, like a Schlossenheit. Yes, you could say that. Uh, it's uh, it's it's a certain way of uh, disclosure of the world, so to speak. So uh, I call it rendering, right? So it's a certain type of rendering of reality, um, uh, which means co-evolutionary, both the mind and matter. So we are not distinguishable in that sense. Okay. So now the point is that now that we know that we uh, that that every reality or every subject object object relation is always a historical one. Um, how do we now get to the outside, to the real outside, to the real reality? Well, it's in the processes that are forming each 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 uh, layer of reality, so to speak. So, in other words, if there is a regularity in the shifts from one stage to the other, then we see a real which is beyond the construction. Yeah. Okay, then there's a reality beyond the construction. So if there's a regularity of the emergence of constructed worlds, then this is the real, or at least a position, so to speak, a, a position from which you can, from which you can look at, from the outside at the constructions in the inside. Okay. So, uh, so this would be a, a very short, uh, like there's more to say on this, but this would be like a very short, just introduction to, to make you understand what I'm saying. So, so in other words, uh, let me see if there are more, no, there's nothing more. Uh, so, so in other words, uh, we, we see that the constructions of the world of the real are changing. And now it's the question, is there a logic or a pattern in the change of the constructed worlds? All right, and uh, by the way, so we can now skip back again to the uh, previous uh, PowerPoint presentation again um, to link that up. So uh, now you see we have different uh, different types of realities, um, which are. Uh, yeah, which which appear with a certain logic, so to speak, and from this logic we can derive the new uh, reality which uh, might appear uh, in the uh, so to speak in in the future, uh, in the immediate in the immediate future based upon. Uh, so in other words, we can expect that a new physical physical reality will appear, that a new cognition will appear, and uh, which not, which will not be scientific in the classical sense anymore. Okay, so in other words, we can say that in the next 100, 200 years, there might be a total shift again, like there was a shift in modernity, right? So appearing. 
And um, yeah, uh, I, I would like to make a link quickly to to the previous text. But uh, can we just take a break for a moment? And is, is this clear what I'm saying so far? At least, I mean, I'm not. Uh, <laughs> you don't have to disagree, you know. But but uh, did I make myself clear what 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 is what it is about? Yeah. Uh, I just have a tiny question because it's not completely clear. Yeah. So, what is real is the kind of invariant patterns and the yeah. kind of con cognitions that construct themselves over time. Yes, yes, exactly. The invariant patterns we are looking now at the uh, invariant patterns of um, uh, of yeah, exactly uh, of um, of the moment. How should I say this? Um, I can use another picture. So you have you have a system and it reaches a bifurcation point, right? And then it uh, go, goes up in one direction or the other direction. And then it keeps on constructing its own world, either in this direction or in this direction. So uh, what was really real, so to speak, was the moment when it when it uh, forked and when, the, when it went this or in this direction, uh, so to speak. This, this is the moment when it emerges when something new is happening okay uh, but uh, this is a very complicated question uh this would take a very interesting question so to speak to to go deeper into this uh, um we talked about this a little bit in the last seminar in in, in the last semester i can i guess i can show you the link to that so i wouldn't go go deeper into that now um but this is exactly the idea the idea is that there are patterns of becoming so to speak and when when we see these patterns of becoming these invariances, uh, then this would be the new realism, so to speak. Yeah. Not what's inside, you know, not what's inside. What when we re relate as objects and subject, but what is producing these object-subject relations, so to speak. So you see what I'm saying. So this underlying pattern, this would be the, this would be the proposal uh, for the new realism that appears with active uh, informationalism. Yeah. Then you see you now how this is different than postmodernity. Um, it bases it, it's built up on postmodernity on on system construction, so to speak, uh, but it goes one step. Uh, beyond that by asking what what is the what are the conditions and the parameters for uh, system construction yeah it's just the next generation yeah yeah i'll send you a link later uh to, to this to, to this uh, it was la layers of generativity <laughs> i remember with uh, patrick sharp was as a moderator <laughs> last year we had a lot of time uh, a lot of fun i wanted i wanted to say so it um yeah it was very a long seminar um okay so uh now listen if you don't mind i don't know how much time we have i would quickly like to link uh this whole thing that i just said to the previous text of razor or do you want to do that we have still half an hour okay Maybe i can accommodate you uh last longer but i still think we should uh now make like a uh, synthesis yeah because um, people might uh, want to leave after half an hour because they have to work another seminar start like that. So after that, we can have a chit chat as for lo as long as it gets. Mm -hmm. Is that okay with you? I'm just I just don't want to go over time and then people have to. Oh, are you asking me? Yes, sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, of course. Uh, um, okay, then. So, so you want me to synthesize now, or uh, because I would say we 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 both. Uh, both, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, well, maybe, but l listen, let's ask the people. So, does somebody see already a connection or a, or a similarity between the two texts in in some way? That's a good uh, good idea. So, I'll just uh, ask everybody in this uh, symposium of sorts. Hmm. Uh, has anybody like already a synthesis floating in their their mind that they want to give us that they want to discuss or is there some non modality that you see between those those texts uh, anybody i mean i can just ask everybody around in this uh, seminar or maybe you can write in the group chat and tell me yes no or uh please ask me or please don't ask me something like that 
Okay. Jump to death because you said you have something. Thanks a good lot. Yeah, no problem. Um, thank you, first of all, for your both of your presentations. That was really clear and um, insightful. The the connection I made between the two uh, texts is, is has to do with language and linguistics. Um, Reza makes the point of um, the development of linguistics or language as a kind of primary or primal kind of mode of objectification of the self uh, that um, that then you know undertakes this kind of evolutionary um, kind of movement that I think links it to your text Devor and so I'm I'm curious because I don't. I don't remember you speaking a lot about linguistics, about how or what role linguistics forms and the development of linguistics form, forms play in the evolutionary picture that you're developing. Um, you know, uh, one thing I was struck by is the difference in linguistic forms between the three texts that we were given. You know, the very almost axiomatic form of your texts, um, Reza's more narrative, uh, base form and then the video with you Patrick is very spontaneous kind of responsive sort of and how each of these can be sort of seen like in Reza's sense as either like sort of re retrograde or, or regressive or else as potentially um, you know in his language developing a new stone or, or having the capacity to kind of push beyond the um, the, the limitations of, say, the form, the, the given linguistic form. But so I'm curious about how you see that, and and I, I might have a follow up after that. So, mm. yeah, I have an opinion on this. Go for it. Can I say? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, okay, this is so the, the linguistic question on, on early culture. Yeah, I'm pretty much, I mean, he mentions uh, language, right, in his text at some point. Uh, this is the brave new nervous system that he calls right the new world happening of course uh, language means we are coupling our nervous systems all of a sudden we start with fiction with imagination we are coupling each other so this is not, this is not so problematic i see the same uh, you know how you interpret it is, uh, is, is you, you can you know you can see it in this way or that way but of course uh, language also for me is important this is part of the notional tool or notional culture so to speak and this is how humans are connecting each other to form temporal operational networks right uh, so this is important so this is also part of this uh, extension of the operational chains um, I see where the question is going it's going actually into something even more deeper than than, than already uh, you yeah, asked. I'll, I, I'm uh, thinking about machinic learning too and mm. or machinic language as well and how um, you know we have there's there's a whole kind of uh, a realm of, of, of you know, machine auto generated language or, or linguistic sort of communication machine to machine, um, some of which is a kind of augmentation of, of human kind of linguistic forms and communication, and some of which is, is sort of sealed off mm -hmm. from um, human linguistic. And I guess I'm struck by the, the, the gap there. And, and I'm wondering if, if our linguistic forms are not as kind of old at this point as say capitalism is in that um are they lagging behind is it, is it, is it or do they feel like sometimes they feel cumbersome to me like the, the way we're communicating in the seminar for example the way i'm asking this question um uh, does that help at all to frame your remarks um maybe not <laughs> <laughs> no wait a second uh well the, the problem is the, I mean, this goes also a little bit in the, in the direction of uh, yeah, of the question of artificial intelligence and so on, of course, because, um, yeah, it's it's hard to say, you know, what a language means. So what are we organizing with the help of a language and what does a computer organize with the help of, the of you know, uh, language? So these are different types. So we have different functions. Uh, a system a system detects totally different. I mean, it doesn't even detect them, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's more like a mechanism. You get input and zip, 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 you know, you have this mechanic... Uh, the uh, switches, so to speak, and in the end you get an output. So there is nothing. I mean, we, we really have to understand this, that even algorithms, even the most complicated ones and neural networks and so on, they are all still mechanistic, uh, very, very complex mechanistic if-then uh, uh, arrangements. 
Okay, so uh, the the only reason why we seem to be seem to be let's say creative, you know, in a in a very broad sense, uh, uh, is because we are very complex and complicated. There are like zillions and billions of, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, uh, but but it doesn't mean that we are not that we are not still mechanistic. So it's basically just a very complex uh, me mechanistic. So in other words, what I'm say uh, what I'm saying is, um, it's a difficult question to think human intelligence in relation to machine intelligence currently because um, we still I don't think we have the conceptual or technical breakthrough to think that machine intelligence is anything beyond a mechanistical emulation of certain functions you, you see my point there, there's uh, so it, it's it's it, it yes, might yeah. be a certain yeah. it, they mm -hmm. might develop a certain language which is kind of you know which 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 may help to map some parts of the world better or not but it's still not a it's still not a language in, in the human sense mm -hmm. so yeah. you're making a distinction between the mechanistic quality of of mm. programming for example or, yes 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 exactly. yeah and yeah. and what what you're calling um we lost you we lost you yes that are the forms you, you know Sorry, Certainly. we have to repeat your question oh. because we lost you the last 10 seconds or something. Yeah, so um, the, you're, you're making the claim that there's a creative capacity to, you know, human linguistic interaction that is not present in machine. Or a different type, yes. yes, yes. A different type. Yeah, let's say. Okay. Yeah. But I would say that, that that's also limited by the particular linguistic forms that we're engaging. Mm -hmm. And that, and I would, I would connect it to, in your analysis to you know, the particular material history that we're engaged with right now. Mm -hmm. So that's just my speculation and my kind of um, projection in a way onto your work is like, well, wh where does this, where do the particular linguistic forms that, um, you know, uh, that, that we're engaged with and that we're limited by in this particular moment sort of respond to or generate from or uh, yeah, yeah. Um, augment um, the material conditions yeah. like the informatic sort yeah. of um you know stage mm -hmm. you know the transitional stage that we're in right now yes so that's yeah i would like to say something on this can, can i sure. do i have time yeah. okay so uh how much is it now? okay yeah this is exactly what uh, what what i found striking and uh about razor's text i mean you've read my text uh, you see my english is not really perfect and my, my style of writing is also very basic let's call it like this right so uh it was uh, for me it was mainly i was happy that i could throw out the ideas uh, uh, to be uh, plausible, to be understandable, I know, uh, but, but it's definitely not a stylistically, you know, refined text or something like this. Uh, so I, I understand that. So uh, how does it gain plausibility? What does it want to do, so to speak, this text? And what does Razor's text want to do? See, see, this is the, this is where we meet. So this is where the, where the two texts meet. And um, yeah, before I get to this question, back again to the linguistics, uh, I want to say that that uh, what what the similarity is between both texts is that we both thinking ourselves from the future, so to speak, right? So this is my text doing, right? Be by showing that there are these layers and that we can think our present already as the seed of this new future, right? So this is the idea. So, so why is this important for me? Because I hope to get out of path dependency by that. Uh, we could stay in modernity, so to speak. We could stay with the same institutions, but we could become aware that we are already dealing with seeds of a new type of society and reality. You see my point? So we can choose if you want to go in this or this direction. Okay. So in other words, by that, uh, by that, I hope, so to speak, to yeah, to make the system transition, uh, so to speak. To uh, why is that? Because systems usually are resistant against change, right? Every system is uh, resistant against change. And so what I did is basically I put a carrot in front of the nose of the system and showed, look, there is a state of you in the future, which is cool for you, you know, it's good, you can go there. So this is the point. And, and, and so it's not, you don't have to be afraid. It's not a resistance. Then you can, so to speak, slowly glide or into this new, you know, in, into this new stage or on, on the other, uh, in, in, this, in this other perspective. So this is uh, related to a theory of a German uh, yeah, one of the most important but most under under overlooked uh, theories ever produced, uh, the, the Mühlmann, uh, Mühlmann's nature of culture. I can send you the, the link or the text. Um, so uh, uh, he says that cultures are basically stress stress collectives, uh, like a little bit similar, like Sloterdijk, he's kind of referring to him. So cultures are, uh, are in a certain way stress collectives and they are repeating 
um, how should I say, we're, we're repeating that, which once was successful in reducing stress long time ago, so to speak. And uh, so uh, it's a very important and, and, um, uh, and, and yeah, very insightful theory, so to speak. Anyway, so uh, the, the point is, the, uh, so that you have to see that cultures are something like a narcissistic uh, animal, which doesn't want to change, yeah, right? And, and um, the question was how to, how to trick the stress vision field of, the, of this animal uh, uh, and, and make it believe that it can shift into a new stage, so to speak. And uh, uh, and this was this was my idea, but probably this is very typical. I'm not a German, but probably this is typical European. Uh, I'm a Croatian, by the way, or Yugoslavian. But um, but uh, but uh, this is, I think, maybe a typical German uh, 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 approach. Maybe you know, like to prove it, to show that this is the rule, this is how it's true, and now we all march in this direction or something like this. And I'm not sure that this works in every other culture, you know. And uh, uh, so, uh, but but anyway, so what, I, what, I'm so what I'm trying to do is to open this space, this horizon in the future from which you can see yourself and say, okay, it's good, I can go in this direction, you know, so, so to open this future. And this is one strategy by, by being plausible, okay? This is one linguistic strategy by being plausible, and I think Razor is doing exactly the same, but you know, and also on the same level, but but in, but with a different technology, he's using, uh, so to speak, fictioning, fiction, so fic fictitious moments that may open something in you, uh, so to speak. Uh, 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 with the stories he's telling, so so uh, yeah, uh, the, uh, the basically you can say, as Patrick said earlier, these are all symbols and stories, right? If they are true, like he tells them, or not doesn't matter so much it's more important that we open a potential for alienation in us right so you see, you see my point it's both it's basically the same strategies but from a different perspective from a from a different side yeah, yeah i see so, that thank you yeah, yeah so so uh, I, i'm opening so to speak uh, i'm i'm uh, you can say with vibrations or with frequency so to speak with dopamine level so i'm i'm mm. i'm i'm uh, how do you say this in, in English? The the tuning tuning fork. Do you call mm -hmm. it a tuning fork? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. So I'm trying. To, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to tune to tune one type of hormone hormone stimulation in the reader. You know what I'm saying? And, and mm -hmm. he's trying to to how to say this? You know to to uh, tune or you know not tune but how to strike? It? Yeah, strike. strike uh, thank you. So he's yeah. trying to stri strike another frequency of mm -hmm. hormone response uh, in 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 the. Uh, in in the reader, so to speak, yeah. uh, he he is more on a hormone response level because he's speaking narratively, on on, exactly. on the and and I'm and I'm more like on a different kind of uh, yeah I don't know actually uh, more formal yeah more formal yeah. but but of course uh, if I may say so quickly about my text of course I hope uh, to produce insights uh, that open your mind so to speak and and it's uh, every time you have like an aha effect you know like this uh, you, when you understand this eureka eureka effect you know this uh, when you understand something of course you also have a hormonal uh, uh, shift your, your world is shifting right so and uh, so in other words both texts are, are, are trying to induce something in this direction uh, but on different levels so to speak yeah I think reading the text was what gave me that sort of sense of perspective on uh, linguistic. Uh, we lost Jeff again. What may, might be a linguistic view. So, sorry, no, I lost you again. Oh, I think no. Reading the reading the text is what gave me that perspective on um, you know linguistic forms and mm. normativity and habits that I'm I'm inhabiting now and the possibility of a. Of an alternative or different linguistic future. Yes. What, yes. what would that? What would oh, that yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. See, this is the point. So uh, uh, this is just something that I just wrote. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway, so the, yeah, you're you're right. So if you look at history, if, if you look at the depths of operational chains, right, uh, then you see that uh, that language is probably co-evolving. Like uh, as I said earlier, the pre-Newtonian cultures they don't have uh, dimension words. But we also don't have uh, certain forms of time, like we don't have uh, how to say this in English, um, the future, pa future, past, future, past, past, present. Uh, uh, I forgot the time, the, the temporal in in English. So where temporal horizon is limited in language, it's not that we cannot think of the tomorrow or the or the yesterday, but everything that was yesterday or two days ago, we just uh, indicate by just saying. Uh, yesterday or something like this. We know, you know, we, we don't have um, we don't have indicators for different, uh, how to say, gra grammatical temporal uh, structures. Why is that? Uh, because uh, everybody in these little tribes knows each other. So you don't need to define what exactly happened when. It's enough to say it was approximately behind me. You know what I mean? Also, with behind me, I mean yesterday. So we don't need. Uh, yeah. By the way, we also often we don't have um, 
differences between space indication and, and time indication they just say behind me or in front of me right logical because what's coming to me and what's uh, what's behind me uh, so for for yesterday or two weeks ago or five years ago they would say it was behind me you know like this and um uh, so uh, the, the the more complex the operational chains get and the more complex the society gets the more refined the structures of temporal uh, indication become because you need to be more precise in indicating, you know, uh, the, the the cooperational points, so to speak. Right? And uh, so, if you look at history, you can see that actually the the, the grammar structures in, in in language are changing. And this was exactly my thesis that uh, we could expect that if this technological civilization really happens and appears, then uh, we will have a new uh, uh, language structure, right? Or the other way around, maybe you can uh, nudge. The becoming, so to speak, of the technological civilization by now thinking ahead and producing a new uh, language structure. You, you see my point? Yeah, that's my sense. That's yeah. my sense. That's yeah. what you were asking. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, this is this is exactly one. This is something I would have liked to talk about. I uh, I'm not sure if I can have another seminar at the new center this summer or at, or at all actually. But this was would have been exactly a part of this uh, of this new seminar to ask. Yeah. You know, to probe the potential mm -hmm. for this new language. This would be one section. So right. can we instantiate the system transition by thinking about what type of grammatic structure must come or could come after all mm -hmm. grammatic structure? You see my yeah. point? So yeah. probing probing this new reality behind us, so to speak. Right. Yeah. right. The section on Goodman it points also to this as well. I think. Yeah, but in, uh, yeah, in a little bit different way, I would say there are yeah. differences. Um, I, I see your point. This grew grew right blue mm -hmm. and green and so on and this new worlds uh, right. this is a little bit different um it's different in that sense that he's still a postmodernist in that sense that he says everything is always open you know you can just make up this world mm. or that world uh, or although there's some there's some specificity yeah. to those yeah. terms though that point to something uh, some yeah. synthesis i think well i'd actually add just a very quick other detail i think mm. that there's something interesting going on with Reza's text especially if we consider these new moves that are being made to kind of couple continental and analytical philosophy. So one thing that you can see in what Reza is doing with predator prey, um, it refers to what in other kind of sects of philosophy are is called uh, psychic continuity. And one thing that's kind of interesting is um, Chomsky, for example, attests quite strongly to this principle of psychic continuity. And in doing so, he ends up breaking with some of the canonical analytic philosophers such as Quine, etc. So it's interesting to see Reza go from kind of continental to analytic and then bringing in this kind of notion of alien and these kind of transmogrified associations actually kind of coming back to a position that's not that different from Chomsky's that's also breaking with analytical um, philosophy. And, to, and with a distinct the narrative structure as well. There's something that right. uh, I'm uh, really thinking about right now. There is, uh, there is this glossolalia that you have. Uh, I don't know if everybody is familiar with it. It is when you have it in, in orthodox uh, uh, jewelry uh, and you have it in evangelical uh, uh, convents, so to speak. And it's when people just uh, talk, quote unquote, gibberish, but it uh, actually derives from from all the language. Xenodoxia, uh, yeah, except thanks. It it's it's actually derives from all the language knowledge uh, that a person has, and uses the uh, like fragmented syntax and fragmented grammar 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 to to build up an angelic or divine language and i was i was i was i did some research on that stuff years back uh, and i actually uh went into the archive for some orthodox uh people they gave me access so uh, it's quite interesting in, in how new languages and how new angelic words are uh were created out of that. Like they have certain words that certain holy guys and w women constantly said, and then those were created, uh, all of that was created new, quote unquote, an angelic language. You see that in new age groups, you can see that. So 
there you have an actual form of uh, language hybridization that is not on, 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 on the le uh, on on an un uh, understanding level like uh, uh, Finnegan's Wake, but but it is actually like a, a lived societal uh, form where uh, the ego, like uh, like Reza puts it, uh, creates uh, the other, the alien, and then uh, it becomes uh, a, a new linguistic entity that is, is completely re-related to where everything is past. So I'm still uh trying to grasp grab with the concept of can we actually uh create a language that is not derivative of what we have right now or uh or is there some possibility to really come up with a universal language or something that is uh that we can actually give to the next generations and that we can actually learn or is it it's more like a theoretical Conundrum, uh, like in, in the, like the like the language that Carnap developed, right? What was yeah. what was that um, called? Somebody help me. Yeah, I also um, in my hand, but yeah, that, that's that's one of these things. I, 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 but because uh, 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 how uh, I can just present it like that is is our wish to create a new. Uh, language, a new uh, Esperanto, uh, maybe a step backward, a step uh, outside of the possibility to create a lingua franca, uh, and more to create an esoteric, in the original terminus uh, technicus, what, what it meant, uh, really like an enclosed society of only 300 people really knowing and being able to read it. Is it going to be a cipher? Or is it going to be a lingua franca? That's that's what actually I'm interested in, and I'm 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 pretty cynical. I rather think it's it's going to be, uh, yeah, it's, I rather think it's going to be esoteric. For all it's good, I mean, it's 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 not that there's only bad in in in, in esoteric language. But then you can also think of uh, when uh, two a uh, computers uh, these two uh, computer programs started uh, their their own language uh, the, we we humans shut it down we were afraid of it maybe i want to give the ball back to davor because uh, no it's okay keep the ball so. okay good wonderful <laughs> uh, no, i computer... mean uh, if somebody has a question whatever i mean let's see or if you let's uh... I think computer crypto is an amazing uh, uh, conundrum as a word itself. Computer crypto I mean, if, if I, Walter Benjamin wrote quite a bit on, I mean, not direct stuff on, on that stuff, but uh, does anybody of you know Einbahnstraße, one way street of uh, Benjamin? I mean, uh, I know a lot of people always are forced to read. Is it's one text of his that I don't really like uh, the artwork in the you know this text, but I really think that Einbahnstraße One Way Street is the most amazing text that he have ever wrote because it's it's more short any anecdotes and it's basically uh, uh, it it looks like like ciphers like 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 it could mean anything, but then if you go deeper in it, 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 it actually has uh, Walter Benjamin, Walter, Good. it's one way street. Yeah. In, in the task of translator, he talks about divine language versus language of men. And uh, yeah, I, I think it might be very interesting to you, Patrick, I mean, yes, for, right. for some reason. Because I think machine language is basically uh, divine language. It's it's the, 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 a lot. I, I I was reading a lot of mysticism when I was younger, and now that uh, AI research is, has come to the fore, I sometimes see uh, similarities between the both, especially about when 
when uh, as a, uh, esoteric and, and, and mysticists describe uh, celestial bodies and, and how the body of God is is is, is made up. Uh, uh, it sometimes uh, there is a similarity, and you can also have a lot of uh, description of uh, how language, uh, the language of aliens and stuff like that. It's, just, it's quite, quite amazing how, uh, for me, mysticism is, 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 is media. It's, it's the first media theory. So just that you know that I'm not completely jumping off to, on a tangent. This is like a big thing for me. For me, uh, mysticism is media theory, is the media of the mind. Uh, it's the first time that humans try to somehow describe it before they actually had uh, epistemology. And there is, uh, if you start, start reading Meister Eckhart or uh, Mechthen from Magdeburg, you can find a lot of stuff that, that uh, if you just drop out the name God and write AI in it, you can have a lot of fun and can possibly potentially just republish it somewhere. Don't do this. But again, back to, uh, to, to, to language. I, I'm, 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 I'm not quite sure about the, 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 the future of, 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 of generated languages. Because uh, C plus and, and all other uh, machine languages that I personally know a bit about are derivative of of, of mathematics, which is uh, in itself, uh, you can potentially describe it as, as, as a language. I mean, please shoot at me with, with, with counter arguments if you if you don't think think that way. Yeah, I was thinking uh, in the uh, the talk you had with that other artist, Thomason, kind of talked about it uh, opening to the outside, as in kind of interacting our kind of realities with the way that a machine learning algorithm would interact with its reality as in he talked about it in like a go perspective how like the uh, opponent the human player in the go against the ai go i mean tom was in real serious. i heard that the human player actually took a couple of days off in between games to think about the way it played but i think this is an allegory or kind of like a metaphor to how if we understand or kind of perceive how maybe a machine algorithm individuates patterns in the world that we don't pick up on if we can then kind of uh create concepts and categories to account for these different kind of functional ways about going about the world then we can kind of create a more of a hybridization between human language and you know external exterior machine languages no, no, I, 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 uh, that was the, 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 inter the discussion I had uh, in Venice with, 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 with Shum. You mean that one? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I can remember uh, that was when I, I, I said we should actually not try to make uh, machines think as we think, but to actually think, make them think as far outside of what humans think as possible to actually get new insights about reality, to actually make more of what is noumenon available yeah. to us. Because uh, a lot of what I've read about AI research is, 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 is stunningly stupid. I'm sorry to say, but it's stunningly stupid because it says, we, let's create a, a Co co a bad copy of humans. And you can always make only a bad copy of humans. You can never. Wait, why is it a bad copy? Hmm? Black box isn't generating whatever patterns are functionally working. That's what the AI is built off. It's not built off of uh, human biases. It's just given a data set and then it just generates kind of different biases and weightings of data in order to create whatever type of function scores high enough for it to then recurs and create and build upon what's effective and kind of like an evolutionary method. I don't see how that is linked with human biases, unless you say by interacting within like a human game or human data set, it's infected, but yeah. 
listen, I would like to say something, please. Please, please. Uh, just a little, how to say this in English, caveat, caveat, like be take care, caveat, right? Like a warning. Um, you have to be very careful with, with all these things. Uh, so uh, I, li I like the idea very much that, uh, wait a second, who was this now? Uh, in the dark, Hutch. Uh, Hutch said uh, that, that, um, that we might need a new language or will develop a new language that will integrate these, let's say, other types of thinking of the machine, as you just said, with the with the uh, with the uh, with the algorithm of the alpha uh, of the alpha go. So so there's a strategy. The machine does something, and and um, it's somehow out, outside of what the humans can do, and that we need a language to implement it. Right. So uh, there's something uh, something dangerous, and this is always happening with the, with the whole AI uh, discourse. Um, in five years, the technology will, will be totally different. You see, and. Um, uh, extrapolating and universalizing, universalizing, so to speak, uh, shifts in existence like new language and so on based on current technologies doesn't make sense because we will change in five to ten years again. Do you see my point? What I'm saying? So uh, everything that we talk about today, so what is AI? What can be AGI and so on? And and all all the problems were all built on a certain stage of technology, so to speak. We are the, the derivatives of a, of a certain certain stage. So it could be that the technology will be so so far uh, ahead, uh, so progressed in, in, in 10 years, for example, uh, that the machines will do their strange patterns that we don't understand, but, but, but we will not see them. Because we will, uh, everything we do in when we relate to humans uh, will be uh, cut down to patterns that we understand. You, you see my point, and in this moment we don't need to develop a new language. You, you see what I'm what I'm saying. So all this physical, metaphysical, and and uh, existen existence uh, relating uh, extrapolation, uh, extrapolations, and uh, uh, the, you know the, the, the derivations of new types of existence. Uh, one has to be really careful with them because we're always only on one level of uh, on a certain level of technology. You see my does it make sense? What I'm saying, or is it trivial? I'm not sure if it's if it's trivial because you see a lot of people building philosophies and something that will change anyway in uh, you know five years, it's, ten years. So what you're kind of saying is that uh, kind of barring maybe an AI-generated pattern, a real pattern in the world, is yeah. just going to be trivial or kind of not that effective because it's using these kind of old uh, temporalities and grammatical structures. So it's not really looking into the future that much. Is that kind of what you're saying? Or oh, no, am I no, missing? No, 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 no. Okay, sorry, I said something absolutely different. <laughs> so like, it's yeah. totally okay, different. They, they yeah, we have, <laughs> yeah, we have a problem. So this is exactly what the pattern recollection, this is the name of the seminar. So what pattern did he just say? And what did I, what do I remember what he just, uh, okay, so um, no, no, no. What, what, I, what I said is this, uh, I understood you in such way that you said that the Go player who lost against the AlphaGo, right? He took some days to think about it. You said, I remember this, uh, as you said. So he was thinking about these new strategies that the AI came up. Is, am I repeating correctly what, what you somehow? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah. so in other words, this is kind of a proof that, uh, that, that, um, that, uh, that the machine intelligences are, so to speak, uh, yeah, I mean, we know that we, we, we are faster than us in, in, in certain ways, so so we can we live in certain patterns. The algorithms produce patterns and 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 and, and you know f sequences and so on uh, that we cannot understand. And, and then you said, uh, if I understood you correct, that uh, that we have to think about to get to to get a new language, so a or, or new part of language that might integrate these new extra human patterns or these new behaviors, so to speak. Maybe not. Maybe not actively integrate, but at least to indicate them language-wise that there's something happened that we don't understand, or that is. Did I understand it correctly? Did you, you said that? Yeah, yeah. Kind of expand our conceptual repertoire of how to how we can represent. Okay. Processes. Yes. 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 Okay. So and what what I'm saying is now this um, that that uh, I agree with that, and I think it's it's correct, and I think that this will happen, and I think this is already happening uh, in in subtle ways, uh, but. Uh, that you know that our language is adapting to the new, uh, let's say, smartphones and, and things like this. In, in many ways, uh, you, you can see. Um, but um, uh, what I'm saying is dangerous to build these. Uh, how should I say? Anthropological extrapolations 
you know, new language, what we need to integrate and what philosophy we can make uh, and, and, and how can we, how we can universalize the world and how we can conceptualize the world uh, based on the technologies that are currently here. See my point? So, uh, because the, the strategies of AlphaGo are only based on the technology that AlphaGo had at this moment. Maybe we will come to it. Uh, so, so it's, uh, yeah. Okay, so what I'm saying is this, uh, I would not, I would be careful with universal, universalizing um, yeah, concepts or relations or uh, types of existence, so to speak, which is uh, a new way of language, for example, based on the current state of technology. This is the, what I'm saying. Okay. Uh, Oh, yeah, okay, uh, it doesn't matter. So it's a little bit more, <laughs> uh, I should have more time to expand what, what, what I mean exactly. So what, what I'm just saying is every five to 10 years, technology is changing. Like literally it is changing. You have a breakthrough here, a breakthrough there. And all the philosophies that are built, you know, so vis-a-vis uh, -vis the old technologies are also crumbling and disappearing. Okay, so we all, yeah. we all are still uh, reading Marshall McLuhan, but we know that he's not enough like the Toronto Media School, for example. So it's it's interesting, it's good to know, but it doesn't map everything we have, uh, every problem we have today, right? So for example, algorithms, he doesn't know, he, he was too, uh, writing too early, he doesn't know what algorithms are because they didn't exist, you know, uh, uh, let's say in, in his reality. And um, so what I'm saying is that, uh, that it's always dangerous to universalize anything based on a current uh, stage of technology and, 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 uh, and make it timeless, you know. Uh, anyway, just a remark, uh, just, a little <laughs> just a little remark. Yeah, okay. I'm just reminded by this, by, by, by this uh, funny presentations of how the future will be from 1800 or 1900. Yes, yes. Or you can even go back of, further and say uh, how people might have told their children how the future will, would, will, will be before they, uh, they invented the wheel or something like that, like yeah. a future out of flying horses or yes, yes. whatever. I mean, it becomes more real the, 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 more, uh, the, the faster we step into the future. Uh, or representations of, of, of it. So, uh, okay. You know, 10 minutes over time, and I will do what I do in all of my seminars, and I will now ask everybody of you to make a question or remark. I will ask you, one and where one. And the first person that I see in my list is Valentin. Valentin, do you have a uh, something you want to ask, something that you want to comment on, or just a remark? I mean, uh, the whole seminar? No, just now, or the, the whole seminar, well, you, can, you have the mic, you can speak. Mm. I, I had a few thoughts here and there. So, so to the last one, I, I, I would just say that I think if you are if you are really participating in this technological process, if you are if your knowledge of the technology is not just that you read about it in the wild, but that you played with it, so you you develop some kind of a taste, some kind of a judgment, which really allows you to see which technologies are are going to stay long enough uh, for it to make sense to build some kind of philosophy upon. And I would not. I would even argue against uh, using technological metaphors as concepts rather than ra as a, um, you know, like we analyze in art forms, like we use them to illustrate a particular process, uh, which is always uh, uh, is in relationship with a particular uh, time. Uh, so yeah, of course, there is, uh, of course, a lot of philosophers who just bl uh, blatantly use. Uh, technological uh, advancements uh, in their philosophies, uh, you usually write something really, uh, the, things that are really sad to, to read. Uh, but I think it has a lot of potential if you do it uh, humbly and uh, if you re really learn, if you really spend time learning how technology works. 
So the next person on in my list is Sean. Uh, do you have a question, a remark, or a comment that you want to uh, give to the class? If not, the next question is to be looked at. Since I can't hear anything from Sean, I will now jump to Roberto. Roberto, do you hear? Hey, Patrick, can you hear me? Roberto, I can Thanks for opening up. Okay. Uh, um, sorry. <laughs> Hello? Yes. Can I ask next time? Okay. Oh, thanks. I actually had, honestly, I had a question. Uh, 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 the connection is bad. About but... emerging... Sorry. Down, down the band. Then we can hear you. Hello? I think she should uh, maybe, maybe Sean, you could uh, protect the microphone from the wind or something like this. Yeah, that would be a good uh, idea. Uh, but maybe uh, since I don't want any gaps, I will just jump to Roberto and will ask Sean later. Or Sean, you can write it in the, the group chat or something like that. Roberto, do you want to jump in while Sean is getting to a point where uh, the wind is not crashing into our ears? Hello, Roberto. Hello, yes. Uh, I didn't have any particular uh, question, I, I don't think so. Maybe uh, just a, a comment that uh, came to mind is um, uh, languages uh, that are actually uh, derivative-based in, in programming which are kind of describing something we don't exactly know. Um, which, uh, something I, I had in mind uh, in this kind of evolutionary sort of projection. what do you want to uh, uh so well, there was a question already i didn't hear a question uh, 40 got cut off yeah so uh no wait a second roberto is still here or not roberto is gone no hmm. oh, i'm here oh, yeah, I... yeah. sorry uh, can you repeat uh, i didn't hear the, the question so to speak i just said that yes um I'm thinking uh, beyond the uh, functional languages uh, in programming, like uh, uh, Haskell and, and others, yeah. um, that uh, are, are, are attempting to uh, work on, on derivation on, on, on math, and uh, particularly on, on derivatives of derivatives. Yeah. Um, uh, and I, I believe there, there is some technical uh, knowledge that is, is produced uh, at this point of of things of ways of communicating um, on, on things we may not uh, already know, but we can detect a certain uh, patterns at least. I, I was just wondering if this is something that is being explored in your research, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a similar thing like uh, Hutch earlier said, so to speak. Yes, uh, new realities are appearing that weren't there before, right? New patterns are appearing now with with uh, uh, technology, and um, and uh, we we will have to sooner or later. Yeah, as as, as uh, Hutch said, we will need to have to conceptualize them, and this could be that then this will also transform language. Depends on depends on if you can, so to speak. Uh, yeah, in, in what way? in what way, uh, way it needs to be integrated. Uh, like, would it be enough just to find a new word, right? Or is it a whole new way of existing with these technologies? So th that means do we need to, to change the grammar uh, uh, in general or domain specific, so to speak. Yeah, so, yeah, it's true. So exactly, this is exactly the point. So we have new, uh, new objects appearing, there is new regularities appearing, new processes appearing, which will, uh, which has the potential to change language. Yeah? Yes, thanks. I mean, that's my <laughs> take on that. Because this is how it evolved before. Um, and that's how it's going to continue. So next in my list uh, of people is Quid. Quid, uh, do you have a remark or a comment? Or 
Hi, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Thanks for opening your mic. Yeah, so the uh, yeah, so first of all, great seminar. Um, I'm really enjoying this. Um, the, the first thing that, um, that 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 I that was kind of an aha for me is that um, I, th I think we have a tendency to think of change as something that we have to uh, that needs to happen like to the entire civilization. And it was interesting to get, to get the perspective of really the coexistence of those evolutionary stages. Uh, and really think about how we do have people on the planet now who are are existing in previous evolutionary stages, and that perhaps we can uh, think of a model of, of of a next evolutionary stage where uh, we don't necessarily have to drag the entire planet along all at once. Um, that was kind of an interesting uh, thought for me. Um, and the, the other thought that I had along the lines of, of this idea of creating a new grammar was that, um, and, and to me it was evident in, in the stages that, uh, that, were ch that, uh, that you chose to, to show the four stages, that uh, there is an inherent acceleration uh, in, in, in the development of new stages. And, that, you know, whether, uh, you know, if you want to, go back to Toffler or even, you know, moving towards the, Kur the Kurzweilian technological singularity and the idea of, you know, that we're going to reach this point where the computers are going to completely outthink us. Um, it's almost a question of whether it's really to us or possible for us to create this new grammar or if it's something that the, you know, AI or computers or technology is going to have to create for us in order to bridge that gap. So those were, those were kind of my thoughts. Oh. Yeah, definitely something that needs to be explored or can be explored, right? So this is uh, an interesting field. Yeah. I don't have an answer. I just can say it's interesting. So <laughs> it's I just have a comment on that because I, I, I can. Uh, we 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 have this this uh, uh, Westophilic notion that that it's that that in West is is, is progression and and everything else is is not. But then you you just have to think of all these uh, new age people and, and anti-vaccination uh, people out there who uh, say science is bad and just like dissolve it completely and go back to nativism and uh, eat some grubs and, and we will be fine and technology is evil. And then you see a lot of amazing, really amazing change coming from all parts of uh, of the world so i uh, i think there is a, a a big shift going on uh in 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 nation state groups in in such that there is like a gradual uh uh change uh and we don't know if uh if let's say the, the green movement in germany will bring more wanting to live in the trees or that they will so, somehow make uh, green laptops. We uh, really don't know the futurology of that. But that's just a little bit uh, of cynical comment on, on that. But thanks, thanks a lot. Great loss for that amazing comment. Uh, James Boyd just left us. Uh, uh, Jeff, do you have a remark, uh, a question or a comment that you want to give to us? Uh, no, nothing more than I've already asked. I just want to say I really appreciate the session. And thank you to Vor and thank you, uh, Pat. Oh, thanks a lot. And, and Hutch, do you have uh, something that you want to uh, give to us? A question, a remark, comment? No, I'm all good now. A lot to think about. Super. Uh, Hanan, uh, how about you? A question? Yeah, or... yeah sure. First of all, thanks for the for such an interesting seminar, both. So, um, yeah, I was thinking about you. You were saying that depending on the constitution of the mediating layers of technologies, we can discover or create different realities, right? So, and even if the human itself can be considered as a media mediating system, right? Now, my my question is more of a now epistemologically, like. Our access is also restrained by the tools at hand at a given epoch. So, how, how from which perspective would one be able to identify the environment structures that 
constitute this real that you mentioned? So how, how can you transcend this? Or is it visible from the inside? That's that's my question. The war. Yep, I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know that I tricked you a little bit uh, because, of course, it doesn't work. What I'm saying, I cannot exclude that I'm not also um, that I'm not also part of this. Um, that I'm also that I'm not a construct myself, so to speak. Um, it's a little bit of a more complicated uh, answer to that. So uh, you can simplify it by seeing pet by saying we are we are we are. Uh, we, are we, are, we are recognizing patterns, okay? So this is the point. So um, what the machine does, it's built to see, to, to detect data, so to speak, and, and to derive invariances, that is to see patterns. And the human uh, basically does the same. And uh, so to see this, this, uh, this, these regularities that, that you can see in the becoming of systems means, means also to see a pattern. You see a pattern, in the seeing of the other pattern, okay, uh, uh, the other way around. You see a pattern in the becoming of the ways of how people see patterns. Did, did that make sense uh, as a sentence? So, so uh, you see patterns in the extraction of patterns by other systems. Okay, so it's a meta pattern, so to speak, uh, and and uh, and I cannot I cannot uh, offer more than that, so to speak. Uh, th this is this is all I can say. So this is where it ends, and my pattern recognition in that sense is also just uh, dependent on 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 my own, you know, uh, how I'm protruded by technology, so to speak. Uh, even uh, it doesn't matter if I look at it, uh, if I look at other cultures, it doesn't matter if I look at. Um, um, uh, uh, at uh, uh, at, at books uh, and derive the patterns, it, it doesn't matter. So I'm also part of this pattern recognition. But the point is this, that uh, not that there is a truth, but that there is a more integrative pattern being derived. Okay, you see my point? So we have pattern, 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 and now a meta pattern comes that kind of derives a pattern in the other pattern observation. That doesn't mean that it's, that it's the absolute reality, but it means that it's a more integrative reality. You see my point? It's relative to the other patterns. It is more real because integ it integrates more. I think I do, yes. Yeah, makes sense. You see my, my, my point, is, so to speak. Um, uh, yeah, so, so, so it's not, um, uh, I'm not saying that, that, uh, that we have any access to any sort of reality or something like this. I, I just say that, uh, that we are just right now, we can enter, so to speak, a new realism in that sense uh, that we find patterns and invariances which are uh, more integrative than the old ones okay got it got it yep thank that you would be, that would be my answer so to speak yeah. so the next person in my list is oh already left so uh that i would say that concludes yeah, seven thank of you for the question. Yeah, nearly uh three hours instead of two and a half and I want to thank all of you for coming and joining us to this eight session seminar. Thanks for appearing in the first session. Thanks to Davor, to uh, our co host uh, and the uh, uh, instructor for, for this session. Oh, thanks for having me. That's great. They are clever people, actually. It's a pity that we didn't have more time. We should have, uh, uh, yeah, maybe, I mean, if I can speak, of, so to speak, for, for myself, it would be nice to have a seminar because I think uh, that these questions should be explored deeper, right? We could just scratch them a little bit from the surface, uh, uh, like like uh, like on the surface a little bit. I think there's a lot of potential and obviously everybody wants to develop things in this direction. So this uh, it, it would be it would be really make sense to have a have a real working seminar. We really not just read text, but really think to develop something uh, together. This would be interesting. I think it's an amazing idea to have a full uh, session uh, seminar for you. Mm. Wait, I'll just uh, stop the broadcast and, uh, and then we can have a li little bit of chit chat off the record if you want so. So wait. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thanks for the session. Thanks for coming in, and we see us uh, next week. 
good bye